Project Gemini, two weeks in space. This morning, the launch of Gemini 6. Now from the CBS News Space Center in New York, Walter Cronkite. Good morning, everyone. This ought to be our most exciting day in space, perhaps succeeded only by the very first space flights. But this is the day when uh, Shira and Stafford are scheduled to go up just 53 minutes from now in Gemini 6 to pursue and catch and finally rendezvous with Gemini 7, which has been up for one week. The weather, we are told, at Cape Kennedy is good for the launch. Everything is go, and the countdown is proceeding normally and is even ahead of schedule. But that does not mean the launch will be ahead of schedule. It's still scheduled for 9.54 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, just uh, 53 minutes from now. And now, here's an announcement from uh, Jack King, uh, the voice of Gemini Control at Cape... This is Gemini Launch Control at the Cape. T-minus 27 minutes, 57 seconds and counting. All still going well with our launch preparations for Gemini 6. At the present time, in the Gemini 6 spacecraft, astronauts Wally Shira and Tom Stafford are going through some power checks with the spacecraft test conductor Don Cromer in preparation for a static test of the spacecraft propulsion system due some five to 10 minutes from now. This is the orbit attitude and maneuvering system where we, which will actually be test fired on the pad with brief bursts from the 25 pound thrusters at about the 15 minute mark in the countdown. All is going well at the present time. We have had no problems whatsoever during this countdown. We still have a 25-minute hold, which will be declared at the T-minus three-minute mark, if all goes well, to tie in the launch time of Gemini 6 for the rendezvous with Gemini 7 coming up four revolutions after insertion into orbit. All going well, T-minus 26 minutes, 53 seconds and counting. This is Gemini Launch Control. Let us explain for a moment our countdown clock. As you see, it shows T minus 26 minutes and 43 seconds uh, at that second. Uh, that means that that is the actual point of the countdown procedures. But at T minus three, there will be a 25 minute hold. That's built in, planned, been arranged for, uh, so that 25 minutes have to be added to the countdown time for the actual clock time of the launch. The clock time is scheduled to be at 9.54 a.m. If it goes precisely at that second or within just a few seconds thereafter, rendezvous will be achieved in the fourth orbit or in the middle of uh, this historic uh, in space Sunday afternoon. If it goes after 100 seconds, it, the rendezvous will be, delay, be delayed another orbit, and after 300 seconds until tomorrow, the rendezvous would have to be held off. But we'll get into more details on that bit of orbital mechanics in just a moment. First, let's hear from Chuck Von Fremd at the Cape as to how things are progressing toward this morning's launch. Okay, uh, Chuck? Yes, Walter. Officials down here at Cape Kennedy are using the phrase storybook or textbook when it comes to the way the flight is going down here so far today. And the glory really belongs to that launch crew out at Pad 19. In an unprecedented eight-day turnaround time between man launches from the same pad, Technicians have to this point accomplished the near impossible. What once was a 90-day turnaround has been cut to eight days, and still there hasn't been a single second's delay in the terminal count that began at 3.29 Eastern Standard Time this morning. The weather also is just lovely at this point. Scattered clouds, unlimited visibility, everything is right on the money. Walter, of course, for all four astronauts involved in today's historic attempt, this has to be the, the biggest day in their lives, excepting for their birth and their marriage and the arrival of their children. But for that command pilot, 42 years old, the oldest of the 28-man astronaut team, Wally Shira, this day is really special. Ever since he splashed down in the Pacific Ocean after the Mercury flight of Sigma 7 three years ago, Shira has made no secret of the fact he wants to be the command pilot on the first rendezvous effort. He campaigned for it out at MSC in Houston day and night uh, with those officials out there, and he finally got his wish. And today, here it is, Wally is go for rendezvous. Since he is the dean of the astronauts at 42, this might be the last space hurrah for Wally Shira. A disciplined veteran test pilot and engineer, he's one of a vanishing breed. Walter? Last space hurrah for Wally Shira, Chuck. 
boy, this is going to be an historic day in space. They, uh, Chuck, the, uh, I gather from your earlier reports before we got on the air that uh, the astronauts uh, climbed into the spacecraft at uh, 8 o'clock, an hour and uh, six minutes ago, and just about 57 minutes ago at 8.09, the hatches were closed. Uh, as you can see from the picture at the Cape, uh, the erector is uh, down, the big 90-foot Titan II rocket booster with their Gemini spacecraft on top stands there uh, with, against the umbilical tower that carries the lifeline cords uh, to the spacecraft and the rocket before blastoff uh, stands there alone waiting for the blastoff to come uh, some uh, 54, 53 minutes from now. The countdown, as we said before, you take that figure and add 25 minutes for clock time because there is a 25 minute hold at T minus three. The reason for that hold is so that all of the countdown procedures can be completed right up to the actual final moments uh, and the, they know that, there will, uh, that they can take care of any minor difficulties in that pad they have built in of 25 minutes so that they can get off on the precise second that will be necessary for a rendezvous to be achieved on the planned fourth orbit. Chuck has given us a report on beautiful weather at uh, Cape Kennedy. Of course, the weather at other points around the world is important too uh, for the recovery of the astronauts if they should have to come back earlier than planned. And Mike Wallace can give us a report on what the worldwide weather situation along the orbital path looks like. Well, along your orbital path from home down to the studio to the CBS News Space Center this morning, Walter, as you saw, it was pretty bad. Matter of fact, there is hail and rain and fog through most of the north central portion, northeastern portion of the United States. But a good deal of the rest of the United States is having first-class weather, as Chuck Von Fremd said. At Cape Kennedy, it just couldn't be better. And then in the primary landing area, in case there is a launch abort, and of course nobody hopes and nobody expects that, about 800 miles east of Cape Kennedy, the weather is simply perfect. Partly cloudy skies, seas from five to six feet. The same thing is true down here, about 500 miles north uh, of the Cape Verde Islands, in case there is a launch abort and the uh, GT-6 had to come down there, the weather is just fine. And then in the two Pacific secondary areas, here about 800 miles northeast of Honolulu, the weather is good, the winds are good, the seas are not too high, about five to seven feet. And finally, about 500 to 700 miles uh, southwest of Tokyo, the story is just about the same. In other words, all along orbital paths today, the weather is good. So there should be no problem either in launch at Cape Kennedy. Let's see, specifically at Cape Kennedy, at launch time, they're predicting 68 degrees, visibility 10 miles, surface winds about 8 miles an hour, and seas of only 2 to 4 feet. Now, we have uh, on this standard Colesman map a speeded-up version of the way that the GT-6 and the GT-7 will get on, and their, hopefully, dual orbits, their simultaneous orbits, if we could take a look at that now, perhaps I can describe what's going to go on. Here comes the GT-7 just before GT-6 liftoff. As you can see, it's just about, there it is over Cape Kennedy, and there goes the GT-6 about 1,200 miles behind on its first orbit around the Earth. About the time that it comes into the second orbit, here it is coming across the Pacific and still about 1,200 miles. But a posigrade burn at that time will bring it to within almost 500 miles. It is catching up because it is in a lower orbit and therefore a faster orbit. By the time the third orbit comes around, it'll be back up to about 160 miles behind and only about 20 miles down below the GT-7. And then finally, when it comes across Southeast Asia, coming into the fourth orbit, then it really does begin to pick up. And as you can see, it is virtually virtually at the same spot and at the end of Revolution 3. Now, coming into Revolution 4, as you can see, over Southeast Asia, the two of them come together and that is when, for the next six hours, they will stay one with the other, looking at each other, maneuvering one with the other. And space history for the United States, world space history will be made. Walter, where are we now on the countdown? The countdown is T minus 19 minutes and counting, 19 plus 25 minutes, so it's now 9.11 and the launch comes at 9.54.
Mike, I was trying to do some orbital arithmetic here to figure out how much faster that uh, Colesman uh, representation is than the actual orbits. Uh, and I don't have it yet, <laughs> to tell you the truth. It's going to take an IBM machine, I think, to do it. But uh, you are making an orbit, I figured, every 18 seconds, and it takes <laughs> an hour and a half to make one normally. So you can see how much that uh, Colesman representation is speeded up. But it is a graphic way to represent this chase that goes on today. A 103,000-mile chase uh, around the Earth, if all goes well, for an orbit. Uh, uh, for a rendezvous in the fourth revolution of Gemini 6. Scheduled to be launched at 9.54 this morning. Uh, the count at T minus 18 and counting with a 25-minute hold built in. CBS News coverage of Gemini 7 will continue in a moment. This is Walter Cronkite back at our CBS News Space Center in uh, New York. Gemini 7, which was launched a week ago yesterday, and uh, at about 1.30 this afternoon, uh, sets a new space record, beating that of Cooper and Conrad in Gemini 5, has now covered some 3,227,500 miles. Uh, and, and the pilots, Borman and Lovell, are up and awake. They awakened once during their night sleep and checked in, uh, then went back to sleep after they were assured that everything was going well on pad 19 for the launch of Gemini 6. They awakened uh, just a little while ago, said they were in uh, good shape. I've been uh, checking in with uh, Houston and Cape Kennedy. Uh, they said they had a little tumbling of their spacecraft last night, which was uh, discovered for the first time. The first tumbling took place the night before. It's caused, it's believed, by the venting of excess uh, uh, water accumulated in the uh, spacecraft, probably from condensation of uh, perspiration in the space suits itself. But the venting of just a little bit of water has very much the same effect in the atmosphereless uh, 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 environment, 185 miles above the Earth, of the controlled jets being vented, and so it causes a tumbling of the spacecraft. This doesn't cause any trouble to the spacecraft in the weightless environment up there or to the men themselves, except uh, for the fact that the spacecraft not being perpetually oriented in uh, one position, uh, the sun does not get a chance to warm it as much as it would normally, uh, baking just one side of the spacecraft, uh, therefore, and uh, the spacecraft temperature is inclined to drop. It did that uh, Friday night, dropped 20 degrees, and Borman, who was in his underwear at that point, was a little bit uncomfortable and got rather chilly. Now for this mission today. Well, it's an exciting one, and uh, Gemini 7, uh, having been up for eight days, has had uh, its share of, uh, well, not serious problems, but the problems of housekeeping. Perhaps uh, Bill Stout, out of the McDonald plant in our mock-up Gemini spacecraft, can tell us what's been going on up there. Bill? Walter, I doubt that I can, but I'm sure that Bob Sharp, a pilot engineer here at McDonnell, can tell us all about it. Bob, to begin with, what is the difference between 6, the one going up today, and 7, the one that's been up there? Well, for the housekeeping provisions, or the stowage provisions, uh, there are quite a few, in that uh, there are added pouches and bags on the side uh, in this area here. There's uh, pouches under the seat uh, for stowage of... Uh, cameras, uh, food packs, what have you. Uh, there are storage provisions underneath the seat that you can't see, which you use for a, uh, essentially a wastebasket. Throw the plastic food containers, things like that in there when they're finished with them. Uh, so with all of that, they uh, try and keep the uh, place cleaned up uh, fairly neat to make it a uh, habitable uh, area. Borman and Lovell had said before this one began that they thought the biggest problem wouldn't be technical or mechanical, but just running a neat ship. Yeah, just existing in this uh, pretty tight confines uh, for a spacecraft. The other differences, of course, that you can't see uh, in here, uh, other than just storage provisions, are um, spacecraft 7 has fuel cells, 6 is using batteries. So on the front panel in this area, our electrical controls and looking at them you don't see very much difference but the uh, operation is considerably different uh, six of course was originally slated to uh, dock with the agena and it has agena controls on the right hand panel that they won't use that's right uh, seven has the radiometric experiment 
uh, incorporated, and so uh, controls for it are in this area of the panel uh, here. What and is that radio red ray? Uh, that's to take uh, infrared, ultraviolet measurements of the star, spectral background, and space objects. So they'll be using that experiment uh, during the uh, docking maneuver. Uh, other things are uh, hidden, like their difference in propulsion tanks, things like that that you don't see. Basically, no difference you can see inside the spacecraft, except for this terrible problem of housekeeping trying to stay neat for two weeks in space. And that's it, they're pretty similar. Perhaps that's the biggest problem of all, Walter, neatness after two weeks up there. Yes, it seems rather odd to talk about housekeeping chores in that little uh, telephone booth-sized space capsule at 185 miles above the Earth, whirling along at 17,500 miles an hour. But that's precisely what they are. They were telling me down in uh, Houston uh, the other day that uh, they expect the final housekeeping, the, the positive stowage of all items for the return to Earth to take the uh, Gemini 7 astronauts probably almost uh, 24 hours, almost a day before they're scheduled to land. A week from today, uh, they will begin uh, stowing their gear. Of course, one reason for that is that there is a lift factor, so-called, built into the Gemini spacecraft uh, based on its center of gravity and unless uh, all of the items are stowed about according to a prearranged plan, that center of gravity can be shifted off just enough to make a difference in that uh, vector of lift, uh, to that, that, that factor of lift, uh, and as the spacecraft comes back into the atmosphere. Also, everything must be well stowed so that nothing is flopping around there, uh, hanging weightless. Uh, they've got to be sure nothing has been put on the side of that spacecraft that hangs there uh, all right during flight in a weightless state. And then suddenly when they get back into the atmosphere and the gravity forces build, that uh, little package that hangs weightless could suddenly come plopping down on the astronauts uh, with the weight of uh, as much as eight times uh, its own weight. This morning has been a busy one, of course, down at Pad 19, getting ready for the launch of Gemini uh, 6, which uh, should be coming now uh, just about uh, 30 minutes from now. It's T minus 10 minutes and counting with a 25-minute hold. So at uh, 35 minutes until the launch scheduled at 9.54. At the Cape this morning, we can review by uh, tape recording some of the highlights of the morning. Uh, Ron Stafford uh, went to breakfast this morning, a small affair. Astronaut Gordon Cooper there, you see, sitting next to pilot Tom Stafford. Of course, the command pilot, Wally Shira. Shira and Cooper are perhaps the closest friend among all the astronauts. Next, the suiting up trailer. Shira is a veteran of the Mercury program, wearing the old style Gemini space suit. So Stafford, not the new lightweight versions that you saw last week on Borman and Lovell. There's Stafford making, preparing to make his first space flight. Dave Schumacher of CBS picks up the story. The van now pulling up to launch pad 19. It's a beautiful morning on the Cape. Sun shining, just a few clouds in the sky, a little haze over the ocean. The door opens, and here come the astronauts. Their white spacesuits, the American flags on their left shoulders. Two Annapolis graduates shaking hands with the work crew here. Shira leading the way up the ramp to the elevator, followed by Stafford. Shira, sort of the gung-ho pilot of the old tradition. In fact, his nickname was Ra Ra. Stafford, also a test pilot, a little quieter than Shira. Uh, both men uh, shook hands with just a few of the workmen here. Uh, not quite the send-off that we saw just a week ago with uh, Lovell and Borman, but it's a little earlier this morning. And now as they go up, here is astronaut Alan Shepard to give us a quick rundown on uh, what the uh, two men have been doing this morning. How are they doing, Alan? Well, actually, they've been just about on the same schedule that we've always followed. Everything has been going smoothly with them as it has with the spacecraft and the launch vehicle. We had a very small group in for breakfast this morning, just Wally and Tom and Gordon Cooper and myself. What were you talking about this morning? We are talking about rendezvous, of all things. <laughs> so uh, there really wasn't very much to do except just review that and, and recheck to be sure that we had everything in order. 
Captain Shepard, you've been in this business longer than anyone else. How close are they going to come? I'd say it's going to be a matter of a few feet. Uh, we really feel, I know Wally and Tom feel, and I echo their feelings, that uh, we really feel very confident that this is going to be just like formation flying in an airplane. And, of course, the way you do that is you start out uh, fairly loose until you get the feeling of it. Uh, then as you get the feeling of the control and the, and the problems that are involved, move on in more closely. Even as the astronauts were being inserted into the capsule, Mission Control was in communication with Germany 7. up of the white room the spacecraft freed for launch we never have quite seen this scene before as the white room is folded around uh, the spacecraft or back away from the spacecraft into the erector which then will be lowered for perhaps the most critical mission so far in man's quest for the moon critical in several ways Rendezvous must be proved out if we are to take the next steps toward the moon, if the Apollo program can really, in every sense of the word, get off the ground. Because unless uh, we can uh, prove out this rendezvous technique, we do not have the means of getting a man back off the moon after putting him there. The uh, LEM, the Lunar Excursion Module, which has been designed for the Apollo spacecraft, carries two men from the main spacecraft orbiting the moon down to the moon's surface and then back to rendezvous above the moon with the spacecraft itself for the return to Earth. So this rendezvous is terribly important. It's also important for other reasons. Uh, if we are to put a manned orbiting laboratory and even a military reconnaissance vessel in space, this is now planned, we have to be able to resupply it, and that requires rendezvous. We have to be able to take men to it and bring them back. It requires rendezvous. And also, there's an important factor that is not very often discussed about rendezvous, but we would like to establish the means for rescue in space. This has not been possible up to now until we find out how we can send a second space ship up after a first and to make contact with it, uh, we cannot uh, achieve rescue in space. So rendezvous is very important for moving the space program on ahead into its next big step. Now this rendezvous uh, today does not include uh, the uh, actual meeting of the uh, two ships. They will not touch. It is not planned that they touch and it is hoped that they do not touch. They do not want damage to either one of these that might impair the success of the mission and endanger the astronauts themselves. Uh, however, they will come within a few feet, as you heard uh, Alan uh, Shepard say there just a moment ago. This is not docking, however. Docking was planned for the Gemini 6 on its October 25th launch, but as you know, the Agena space uh, vehicle, unmanned, that it was to chase and dock with, uh, blew up uh, before achieving orbit, and that mission had to be scrubbed. This is a make-do mission, and in many ways, it is more dramatic and exciting than the first, but it does not include the docking, which also is essential and will not come until Gemini 8, probably uh, around March of next year. We are expecting an announcement now from uh, Cape Kennedy, the second we have heard since we went off the air from uh, Jack King, the uh, voice of uh, Gemini Control until launch. Well, they say now it's going to be another minute before we uh, hear from Jack King. They give us a, a signal from there as to when they expect to come up with an announcement, and sometimes they change signals on us. The count is a T minus three minutes and 30 seconds and counting, but uh, as we told you, in just 30 seconds from now, there should be this automatic hold of 25 minutes. In other words, the count will be suspended at T minus three for 25 minutes, picked up again 25 minutes later at T minus three and on to the count of T minus zero. Uh, the launch at 54 minutes after the hour scheduled. That will be the launch of Gemini 6 for the pursuit of Gemini 7 and rendezvous in space. Now let's see if we can bring in Jack King.
This is Germany launch control at the Cape. We are T minus three minutes and holding. T minus three minutes and holding. This is the plan hold and the duration is expected to be some 25 minutes. We have had a perfect countdown thus far today and the hold time, the planned hold time, now must all be used up during this period in order to get us off with Gemini 6 at the correct time for the rendezvous maneuver. The flight director, Mr. Chris Kraft, has just notified the launch pad that the liftoff time will be the same as he reported earlier, and that is 9.54 and 6 seconds a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We are now holding at Launch Complex 19. Everything's still going excellently at the present time. This is Gemini Launch Control. CBS News coverage of Gemini 7 will continue in a moment. Walter Cronkite back at our CBS News Space Center on this Sunday morning, which is destined to be an historic one for the manned space program, either Russian or American, for today. It's supposed to mark the first rendezvous of two manned space vehicles. Gemini 6 is scheduled to be launched at 9.54 this morning. That's 55 minutes from now. And 52 minutes from now, I guess it is. The count, actually, at Cape Kennedy is T minus three minutes and holding a planned hold so that all contingencies can be taken care of and they can get this vehicle off exactly on the second that they want to in order to uh, make that rendezvous with Gemini 7 on the fourth orbit the middle of this afternoon. At this moment, Gemini 7 is out over the Pacific Ocean. It's just cleared Australia. It's just in touch with the Rose Knot Victor, a, uh, a tracking ship out in the Pacific, and is en route back to the uh, United States as it whirls in its eighth day around the world. Scheduled to pass the previous endurance record in space set by the United States in August by Gordon Cooper, Pete Conrad of uh, just short of eight days. Passes that about 1.30 this afternoon. Let's review quickly what this day is all about. The first rendezvous in space with Gemini 6 and Gemini 7. Gemini 7, meanwhile, establishing the longest flight in space, and by the time it returns next uh, at the end of uh, this week, it uh, will have been up 13 days, 181 hours if all goes as planned, some 206 revolutions. The pilots, Frank Borman and Jim Lovell, have uh, been doing excellently as has their spacecraft. It's been a perfect flight since they lifted off a week ago yesterday. Uh, they have achieved another first in space, the first space flight in underwear environment. While the Russians put up uh, three men uh, who flew in shirt sleeves, for the first time, Americans have taken off their space suits and flown around in their underwear. That Gemini 7 launch was exactly on the mark at the precise second it was supposed to get off, 2.30 p.m. last Saturday, and their splashdown should come around 8.25 in the morning next uh, Saturday, this coming Saturday, December 18th. Gemini 6 is supposed to go off at 9.54 uh, this morning, and uh, they should be coming back if they achieve the rendezvous today, tomorrow morning, around uh, 11.40 a.m. If they do not achieve rendezvous today and all missions have been accomplished, they will then uh, come back on Tuesday morning. If there is a further delay in launching today so that they cannot get off in the window, the period of time when they could still make rendezvous in the next uh, day or two, uh, by going off today. They can still go any day this week during uh, certain uh, window periods of around 47 minutes each and achieve rendezvous with Gemini 7. So uh, a long hold today would not be disastrous to the flight plans. Rendezvous should come around 3.52 this afternoon on the fourth orbit as these two spaceships fly at 17,500 miles an hour, 185 miles above the Earth. The rendezvous itself, the actual closing maneuvers coming over the Pacific Ocean. They will fly in formation within a few feet of each other, uh, with Gemini 6 flying around Gemini 7, first in plane, that is, uh, around in the same orbital path, and then out of plane, around in this fashion. Uh, they'll do that, uh, do it uh, one time each, They'll close and, uh, and then 
pull away and close again with both the Shira and Stafford handling the controls. They'll do that for about four hours, finally breaking off at around 8.20 uh, tonight. This is all a nominal mission, that is a normal mission, everything going as planned. The astronauts, uh, as you so well know by now, unless you yourself have been on the moon, are in Gemini 7, Frank Borman and James Lovell, uh, both 37 years old, and in uh, Gemini 6, Wally Shira. And here is a first, a first picture, live picture from the aircraft carrier WASP. For this mission, we have some television history as well as space history, we hope. We have the capability, as you see here, of sending a picture from the aircraft carrier WASP. It's about, I think at this moment, around 500 miles off the coast uh, of uh, Florida. And that picture is being relayed to the early bird satellite, back to Earth and to you through uh, CBS uh, television channels and your local CBS station. We're hoping through this camera, and if the pictures are as good as this, we will be delighted to see tomorrow morning the recovery of Shira and Lovell, and later on in the week, the recovery of uh, Borman and uh, Lovell, or Shira and Stafford tomorrow, Borman and Lovell on next Saturday. We'll get uh, an immediate picture of them as soon as they're brought back to the aircraft carrier WASP. That's usually within a uh, half hour to 40 minutes of their landing in the Atlantic, uh, some few hundred miles off the coast of Florida. Those occasional little breakups you see in the picture, we're told, are because of the radar aboard the aircraft carrier WASP, uh, a function that we're not about to interfere with, of course, with, with our television cameras, although we have to suffer a few lines from them. This is a live picture at this second aboard the aircraft carrier WASP, where our correspondent Dallas Townsend is standing by to give us a report by voice when uh, need be, when the recovery period starts. There are the big radar scopes and guns of the uh, WASP, special radar that helps them establish the return of the space craft from space back into the atmosphere and that flaming descent, which uh, is scheduled for Shira and Stafford tomorrow morning. With that radar, they can hook on to that tiny spacecraft of the four tons that uh, is propelled into space, uh, barely half or less than half comes back that 18 and a half foot high by seven foot six inch uh, at the widest point, the bottom, three feet two inch wide at the top, capsule comes hurtling back to the surface of the Atlantic. The booster, of course, the 90 foot high two stage, three engine, 430,000 pounds or 530,000, including the second stage a booster has dropped away long since in the first uh, six minutes of the flight. We can take a look now at one of the dramatic developments of this last week. As Gemini 7 first got up into orbit and began its most successful turns around the Earth, the focus of attention this week shifted to pad 19. The whole question of whether this rendezvous could be accomplished or not depended on whether Pad 19 could be readied three times faster than it ever had before uh, in order to get Gemini 6 up. For we have only one launching pad capable of handling the man-rated Titan II. Now that is Pad 19. Borman and Lovell blasted off on Saturday afternoon and almost before the uh, smoke from their rockets had cleared away. The workmen were on the pad beginning to prepare it. Those technicians on pad 19 have produced a minor miracle in uh, getting uh, the pad ready. It turned out that damage to the pad was greater than in any other of the Gemini launches, including Gemini 1, which had caused considerable damage to the pad. When those 430,000 pound thrust rockets go off with that great blast, they uh, do cause damage, of course, to the erector and to the umbilical tower. Uh, that damage uh, before this has been repaired in roughly uh, three weeks' time. This time they had to do it within nine days. Well, they did it in even far shorter time than that. 
Here are the Lovell and Borman. A week ago yesterday, just eight days ago, they set off jauntily on man's most demanding space mission. A 14-day journey highlighted by a meeting in space with another Gemini capsule, today's hoped for rendezvous. A week ago Saturday, they were rookies. Today, as a crew, they've had more experience in space than any other. As the astronauts left the van at pad 19, we looked closely at their spacesuits. They were new, specially designed for the long flight. Eight pounds lighter, almost a third lighter, 50% lighter, actually, in weight than those worn previously by Gemini pilots. Everything went remarkably smoothly on launch day and in the days that have followed. Even the lightweight spacesuit was to prove unnecessary except for critical periods such as launch and rendezvous, and then only as a safety backup. Lovell took his suit off last Monday, only put it back on on Friday so that Borman could enjoy a day of flight in his long johns. The men in the blockhouse uh, brought off that launch precisely as planned. Here they are. Seemed almost as routine now as the takeoff of a jet plane. Here's how that launch looked to the men on the ground. And here's how that missile looked 10 miles up in the sky to the pilots of the chase planes. We couldn't see the separation. The cloud cover got in the way of our long lens cameras, but the camera in the chase plane recorded it this way, Gemini 7 on its way. There it is, a beautiful shot of separation as the big booster dropped away. The men in the blockhouse had double cause for satisfaction. Let's watch that launch again. Drop the camera's eye to the pad. The Gemini 6 launch was to go off as scheduled. We suggested the pad would have to survive that intense heat of the flames and the smoke, which you get a very vivid picture of there. Walter. News now from Cape Kennedy from the uh, weather forecaster. Here along ICBM Row, which is about seven miles long, we understand now there's a heavy bank of clouds out over the ocean off pad 19. Right here is pad 19. But according to the Cape forecaster, the clouds are running parallel in a northerly direction, so they won't affect launch operations. Over this pad, over pad 19, there's a high, thin, overcast sky. The temperature there, 70 degrees which is about normal for this time of the year, perhaps a little bit higher. The wind only one to three knots. The humidity out there at the Cape is 92%. So that we can understand a little bit about uh, where things are down on the Cape, here's pad 19. And if you can follow my pointer down to here, this is Gemini Launch Control, where the voice of Jack King has been coming to you from. It's about two and a half miles, two and a half miles away. Let's take a look now, though, at what's been done around pad 19. Since a week ago yesterday, the booster for the Gemini 6 flight was on its way to the pad within a couple of hours of the launch. The story, as you've said, is dramatic and as important as the precision of the launch itself. The space agency had never tried such a fast turnaround before, and it worked even better and faster than anybody expected. The technicians worked through that Saturday afternoon and evening. They repaired what blast damage there was, checked out the cables and the fuel lines to make the pad ready for the huge rocket. And then 10 hours and five minutes after the blast off of Gemini 7, the first stage of the booster for Gemini 6 was ready to go into place on pad 19. Up here, it is now just minutes into Sunday morning and the booster is up. The second stage was swung on top of the first stage by six o'clock, about five and a half hours after this, that the second stage was put up and then the spacecraft itself was wheeled up to the path. Spacecraft and the booster had been stored at the Cape since the failure to launch GT-6 back on October 25th. Now, because the spacecraft and the booster both had been checked out for that uh, late October flight, a procedure that normally takes 29 days was compressed into less than 24 hours. The spacecraft was mechanically mated to its booster on Sunday, just afternoon, 1240, there was only one real problem in the entire turnaround on Tuesday. The onboard computer that's vital for today's rendezvous had to be replaced because of a faulty memory, but even that scarcely slowed down preparations. 
On Wednesday, then, the astronauts, Wally Schirra, Tom Stafford, flew a simulated mission. That was a success. And when it ended at 9 p.m., the go-ahead was given for the preliminary countdown for a launch today. Eight days ago, when Gemini 7 was launched, Schirra and Stafford hoped to fly tomorrow. Even that seemed like a long shot then. Today's planned launch, then, is a day earlier than originally scheduled. And there was word from the Cape this morning that it is even conceivable that they could have done it one day earlier, the launch could have taken place yesterday. As an old uh, racing driver, Walter, although I believe you've, you've given that up now, as an old racing driver, uh, I'm told that it's very much like a pit stop in an auto race, what has taken place here at Pad 19. When you take off all of the wheels, put new tires in, gas it up, check it over and put it back together in a matter of seconds, well, that's really what has taken place here at Pad 19. Mike, you know, they, uh, uh, as I was saying a minute ago, uh, they had more damage on Pad 19, actually this time, more serious damage than they've had in any launch, including Gemini 1, when they bent one of the umbilical tower booms. Uh, but uh, as one of the launch directors said, God was with us. None of the damage was vital to Gemini 6 flight. Uh, if it had been another Gemini 7 or that configuration, they couldn't have gone in anything like this amount of time. The hydraulic line, for instance, uh, I mean the uh, hydrogen line, which has to uh, fuel, uh, fuel up the fuel cell hydrogen, was severed by the blast and also was the main electrical conduit. But they were able to patch around that electrical conduit until they could repair it. Uh, Walter, the, uh, some people have asked why there is only one pad that a Gemini flight can go out of here at Cape Kennedy. Now, for instance, the Air Force on pad 40 and 41 here hope to send up flights maybe as many as 40 a year. But this is just like one rifle, and, and uh, there's a specially configured bullet, which is the Gemini Titan, which, can, which is the reason that only one can go out of pad 19. It uh, worries me that... Uh that they are so quick to replace a computer simply because of a faulty memory. I hope they're tougher on machines than they are on men, or I know who's going to be the first to go around here. I can't remember why, though. <laughs> now, CBS News coverage at back at CBS News Space Center, and we uh, should be eight minutes from the launch of Gemini 6. The count is T minus three and holding a deliberate built-in hold. The hold should last another five minutes, pick up in five minutes, and the launch in eight minutes. We're expecting an announcement now from the voice of Gemini Control in Houston, Paul Haney. Gemini Control Houston here at 187 hours, 16 minutes into the flight of seven. The Guaymas... The Texas Capcom down at Corpus Christi has just advised Seven that he is go on the ground. They need not acknowledge, and it's uh, we just don't know whether they will or not. Let's tune in there as they swing over Houston and try to see what, if there is any conversation. Seven, Borman and Lovell, up over the western coast of Mexico, asking how things are going to be uh, for the Gemini 6 launch. 
story that they're getting is that everything is go for the launch. By the time they come around again, Gemini 6 will have been launched and will be in hot pursuit. Will be considerable miles behind Gemini them. Gemini Control at Houston here again. Two fairly quiet astronauts this morning who are expecting two visitors very shortly. Let's go down to the cave now and find out what, what's doing with spacecraft six. Four and six seconds for the liftoff of Gemini 6. We've just had a final status check prior to resuming the count. All elements checked in as go. Wally Shira, the command pilot of Gemini 6, checked in as fueled up and ready to trot. We're now just a few minutes away from resuming the count. We're still at T-minus three minutes and holding, all looking well at Launch Complex 19. This is Gemini Launch Control. That count should be resumed in about two and a half minutes, a 25-minute hold built into the count to enable any last-minute uh, corrections that had to be made to be sure they get off on the precise second. They Second-by-second second timing being so important to rendezvous at some 17,500 miles an hour. As Gemini 6 blasts off in a scheduled four minutes from now, they should be uh, around 1,200 miles behind uh, Gemini 7 as they, uh, Gemini 6 is inserted into orbit and begins its pursuit of Gemini 7. Gemini 7 itself now is now just about approaching the uh, Cape on uh, its 117th orbit. It itself is some uh, two and a half, three hours, three and a half hours away from a new uh, space record and all is going well in 7. A minor trouble with a fuel cell stack apparently has corrected itself and everything is working to perfection on the 7. They have even partially accomplished uh, one of the most uh, exciting uh, novel of their experiments. They did see, for the first time after six days of frustration, a laser beam from Hawaii last night. And now an this announcement from Jack King. control at the Cape, now some 10 seconds away from resuming the count at T-minus three minutes on the Gemini 6 mission. Coming up shortly, Mark. We are at T-minus three minutes and counting. T-minus three on the Gemini 6 mission. All looking good at the present time. We've gone through a complete checklist once again, and we are counting, leading up to a launch just a short while from now. This is Gemini Launch Control at the Cape. And 42-year-old Navy Captain Wally Shira, 35-year-old Air Force Major Tom Stafford sit there in their Gemini spacecraft for the uh, second time after being frustrated October 25th. They're now in hopes of being launched in less than two and a half minutes from now to pursue Gemini 7 in the heavens. Announcement from Bernard Eisman aboard the USS Wasp. It will look something like this, but the carrier will be in a different position from the one we're in now. It will be about 450 miles south of Bermuda, and we'll have 11 planes in the air for command, for tracking, for search, and primarily for recovery, of course. And now on the flight deck is my colleague Bernard Eisman. Bernie, what's the situation down there? Well, down here, Dallas, the flight deck, of course, is bare of the recovery aircraft that took off this morning. But tomorrow, there'll be action here. The backup aircraft will have been winding up on the deck all the time that the recovery operation is in effect. The doctors in the sick bay will also be standing by. This is Bernard Eisman with Dallas Townsend aboard the Wasp. Minus One and a half minutes. Channel power. One minute, 20 T minus one minute seconds. and 20 seconds. As we lead up to the final moments of launch, to repeat an earlier announcement, we will have ignition at zero, and some three seconds after ignition, the launch vehicle will lift off on the start of the Gemini 6 flight. T minus 60 seconds and counting. T minus 60. T 
T minus 50. Astronaut Chirar making some final comm checks. T minus 40 seconds and counting. During the final 10 seconds of the count, astronaut Alan Bean will give the count to the astronauts in the spacecraft. T minus 30. T minus 25 seconds and counting. The pre valves on the launch vehicle have been opened. This permits the propellants to come down just above the thrust chamber. T minus 15 seconds and counting. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. We've got a shutdown. No lift off. The engines have shut down. Fuel pressure is lowering, Wally Shiraz says. Apparently in safe condition. Yeah, fuel pressure down about 32. We're watching the fuel pressure lower very carefully. There will be no launch. A critical moment now, getting the fuel pressure down. Oxidizer pressure lowering nicely. Blockhouse is asking for a readout on all tank pressures. Any malfunction that would have kept the ship from getting into orbit would have caused those engines to shut down on the pad and something did occur immediately after ignition as you saw the engines simply burst once and then shut down an automatic shutdown Elliot C is putting in a call to seven to advise them that we will not have a lift off Frank Mormon says Roger we saw it we saw it light up we saw it shut down by golly, Gemini 7 up there above the Cape saw what we saw here, of course, at 185 miles distance. He assures uh, Frank Warman that everything's still okay on the ground here, and we'll keep him advised. All safety features have been built into these rockets, of course, but once you have an ignition like that, and fuel has been burst, and has, there is a shutdown, there is always danger and concern. Until the fuel pressure has been brought back to normal, until the is sure that the valves are cleared of fuel coming down into the combustion chamber, uh, there will be uh, some concern, crossed fingers, and then, of course, off and uh, Tom Stafford, Wally Shira talking now about what they saw at the moment of ignition and then how they saw the various pressure gauges and dials start, start dropping just as we did here in Houston and as I'm sure they did in the blockhouse. This is of course the first time that this has happened in our manned space the program. shutdown would have come before 1.6 seconds. It's approximately at that point where we reach 77% of a full thrust and beyond that point uh, an on-the-pad shutdown is not possible. We have not had this in the Mercury nor the Gemini program. A lot of unmanned vehicles have had shutdowns on the pad. It's not an unheard of thing in our missile program, but it is unprecedented in the manned space program and causes this concern. Of course, Shira and uh, Stafford, who were thwarted in their flight October 25th, have been flight, uh, thwarted quickly, again. On there are two the theories flight. here on what caused the shutdown. One, it was an automatic switchover, which is a condition that automatically shuts down the engine. That is a guidance switchover from primary to secondary guidance. This can occur in the first second and a half and cut the engines down. Another theory is there was some erratic behavior in the hydraulic. Uh, hydraulic lines in the primary or the secondary, which could have also caused an immediate shutdown. Of course, this automatic shutdown... We're conferring now with the flight director. When we have additional information, we'll come back to you. Seven has been advised. They apparently saw the uh, light up from the air as they swung over the cape, and they saw it shut down. 
This is Gemini Control, Houston, at 187 hours, 28 minutes into the flight of seven. This automatic shutdown is uh, actually a safety device, of course. The shutdown of the engines occurring if anything is likely to go wrong in the powered phase of the flight. Uh, it is to keep the bird on the pad and the astronauts safe there uh, while, the, while the difficulty is checked out. It is unlikely that uh, Gemini 6 can now get off today. There is a pad built in of uh, a window of 47 minutes uh, that uh, they could launch in and still achieve a rendezvous uh, with this launch of Gemini uh, 6, but uh, until they check out why uh, that shutdown occurred and probably have to rebuild pressure and even perhaps refuel the uh, Gemini uh, 6, uh, there is very little likelihood of a launch. It seems most probable now that uh, a launch will be delayed at least uh, 24 hours. The launch would come tomorrow at a slightly different hour, uh, depending upon the orbit of the Gemini 7. We're waiting for further word from the Cape as to uh, what they will be doing at this point. But it seems to us here, uh, which is only a uh, semi-educated guess that uh, they will be putting that erector back up. And, uh, and there is the scrub, apparently, of Gemini 6. Let's uh, go to Chuck Von Fram, that Cape Kennedy, who perhaps can fill us in with more detail. Chuck? Yes, Walter, uh, I'd like to point out that just one year and three days ago, uh, the identical thing happened out there at Pad 19 on the launch, the schedule launch of Gemini 2 a launch that did not take place because of a hydraulic malfunction, which caused an abort just like the one we saw here this morning. The engines came on back on December 9th of 1964. There was a big yellow-orange cloud of flame, and uh, nothing happened. The booster just sat there. Less than two seconds after the uh, ignition, there was an engine cut down, and now we've seen the same thing here again today. Uh, I do think this is kind of interesting because it happened almost to the day, a year later. Uh, for the time being, at least frustrating our attempts to send up uh, Shira and Stafford to rendezvous with Borman and Lovell. Uh, we should be getting more information uh, very shortly from Houston and from the Cape here as to their next plans, but uh, I think you've assessed the situation uh, correctly. There will be no launch today. Well, Chuck, we uh, have unofficial word uh, that the mission has been scrubbed, uh, but uh, nothing official, as you know, from uh, mission control yet. Uh, and we don't know what their uh, mission scrub means, whether it means that Gemini 6 as a complete mission has been scrubbed or whether it's been scrubbed only for today's launch. Uh, if they know something about uh, engine damage uh, because of this uh, uh, shut down, they may be scrubbing the entire mission, but we do not know that as yet. Walter? Yeah. Uh, can I come in again on this you one? Bet. Because I think it is uh, pertinent. Uh, last December 9th, they announced that they probably could have gone within the next two hours. Walter? Yeah. Uh, can I come in again on this you one? Bet. Because I think it is uh, pertinent. Uh, last December 9th, they announced that they probably could have gone within the next two or three days' time with the launch of Gemini 2, which was the second and last of the unmanned launches. But they decided because they were coming close to the Christmas season, uh, the holiday season, and uh, a lot of overtime pay, uh, and because it was an unmanned flight and they thought they had a pretty good readout on what their problems were, they decided just to slip arbitrarily into January. But uh, launch officials told me then, last year, that they could have gone within two or three days' time if they had wanted to push it with the flight of Gemini 2. Now, of course, the situation today is far different. Uh, we've got a lifetime of seven more days for the Gemini 7 astronauts who are up there in orbit now. We want desperately to try this rendezvous checkout. And so I would think if it's at all possible, uh, people like Chris Kraft and John Yardley and others will be uh, really pushing to try and get uh, six ready to go again during the orbital lifetime of Gemini 7. I feel sure that you're right about that, uh, Chuck. Uh, as we know our entire space program would be delayed considerably 
uh, even uh, ordering some of the Apollo hardware, I gather, uh, if we don't get uh, this rendezvous mission off pretty soon. I've been advised, uh, Chuck, also, uh, information you probably have there, that a minimum turnaround, it's now considered, is 48 hours after the cause is determined. Now, if they establish the cause uh, early on today, that means perhaps they could still meet the launch window on uh, next uh, Tuesday. Uh, but uh, that's all speculation. As you say, we have seven days. The uh, Gemini 7 is scheduled to come back on Saturday, uh, but uh, Chris Kraft and others have pointed out that uh, they could keep the Gemini 7 up an extra day, or even uh, it has been suggested by some down in Houston two days, if all of their consumables are still in good supply, if they, in other words, have enough food, uh, water, and uh, the supply of fuel for maneuver and uh, for the supply of the environment, oxygen, uh, is uh, adequate. That would be a determination to be made later. Uh, at any rate, uh, they do have uh, a pad in here uh, this week, any time this week, uh, in the area of the launch windows, 47 minutes on alternate days, with a second window opening on the other days, uh, they could still get off. There is a nice close-up view of the uh, Gemini capsule, the dark portion, the part of the uh, spacecraft that returns to Earth, the white portion there, the adapter section and equipment section, uh, which has the life-sustaining equipment and the retro package for bringing it back to Earth. Uh, and it sits there, presumably now, reasonably secure and safe, as the pressure increases into the tanks and the engine area that had to be shut down after just a minute and six, or one and six tenths seconds, rather, of thrust. We can take a look at that ignition in stop action uh, as that ignition was called precisely on the second when it was meant to go and then shut down. This will be stop action. You will see in a moment the uh, burst of flame as the 430,000-pound thrust engines cut in. Now, after the engines cut in, the, the booster stays on the pad. There it is. There's the first burst of the flame. The booster stays on the pad for three seconds while it builds up power uh, for the liftoff. Then the bolts are blown, which hold the booster to the pad, and three seconds after ignition, it takes off. It was in those three sections, three seconds, halfway through, that the shutdown came. You see this in stop action, split second by split second. And there the booster stands now with the Gemini spacecraft on top. We're not uh, privy. Uh, Our situation yeah. is this. The the lockout, the shutdown, came from the programmer in the launch vehicle. Something in the sequence of events that uh, was out of spec, or perhaps the programmer itself was. In any case, it shut the bird down. We did get a liftoff signal, which would be an indication that the one of the plugs in the base of the bird did disconnect. An unusual turn of events. The uh, mission director has advised that we will, we will uh, tentatively attempt to recycle this mission four days from now. We believe we can go in and work on the bird in that time, repair the whatever is necessary, and perhaps launch six four days from now. This is Gemini Control at Houston. I would mean a Thursday launch of, uh, of the Gemini 6. The computers will have to determine exactly what time of the morning that launch would come, when the window would be on Thursday, but it would be uh, roughly the same hour as today, sometime in the early uh, or mid-morning hours for a launch on next Thursday and an attempted rendezvous on next Thursday. They have determined uh, where in the system, this complicated system, uh, the the failure came, or at least the signal came for the shutdown, but they still don't know why, that it came from the programmer. That's the, that's the little uh, uh, amazing uh, 
set of computers that determine uh, exactly that every phase of the uh, liftoff uh, and uh, subsequent uh, systems is working properly. If any one of those systems is out of kilter, the programmer orders a shutdown of the engines. It was not a gimbling of the engines uh, in the inertial guidance system or in the original in the guidance system uh, that caused the shutdown. The most dangerous feature in the, the powered flight of a rocket is if in this type of rocket, a Titan II, is if a inadvertent uh, move, movement of the engines. Uh, the engines actually move at the base of the rocket, and depending on the, uh, the, the direction of thrust, guide the rocket in its first phase of flight. Well, if that, uh, if that engine gimbals over hard to one side, I don't know what seems to be happening out there at the pad at the moment. Uh, they seem to be venting some of the fuel. Perhaps Chuck Bunfrem can tell us, Chuck. Yes, Walter, I think that's what they're doing right now. I'd like to point out one thing, which I know that you realize. Chuck, just a second. You've got a monitor there? What is that shot we see now? Uh, I'm, sitting out, out uh, I'm sitting out here on top of our uh, flight deck here, and uh, the sunlight's so bright it's kind of hard to see. Oh. Uh, as, as far as I can tell, Walter, that's one of the Aerojet engines that uh, we're looking at right this minute. Yes. Uh, that's the Aerojet engine, one of the two that's in the uh, Titan II on its way. That's a live picture of the base of the uh, engine, uh, and it uh, apparently is is venting in there. I suppose that they must wait, Chuck, for the for that venting to be completed before they can put the erector back up and begin to retrieve the astronauts. I would think, Walter, it would be at least an hour before the uh, the two pilots are able to climb out of their spacecraft and come back down the elevator. Uh, Walter, what I started to say was, we came within about one second of disaster here down here this morning. It proves again how invaluable this uh, automatic uh, sequencer, you know, the programmer, uh, is where men's life are, are involved. Uh, had that bird been committed to flight, uh, according to the programmer, uh, it, would have, it would not have had sufficient thrust uh, to achieve orbit. We would have had a, uh, at least a potential disaster on our hands. One of the plugs actually disconnected, according to Paul Haney. Uh, so this was really a cliffhanger this morning here. Uh, I think probably Sharon Stafford uh, appreciate this more than anybody else. This is certainly as close as we've ever come uh, uh, to uh, a real problem on uh, liftoff, a, a dangerous problem on liftoff. Of course, there, Chuck, as we know, uh, this uh, the automatic sequencer and shutting shutdown of the engine is just the first of many safety factors built in for man to space flight. If it had gotten up and had not been able to achieve orbit, uh, at that point, uh, Shiraw and Stafford would have, uh, if they'd gotten high enough, have separated their spacecraft from the booster, even as they would in a normal flight, uh, blown the, their spacecraft loose from the booster, in other words, and then uh, re-entered as they would from uh, space in a fairly normal re-entry, and probably, according to the planned path, in such an eventuality have come down off the coast of West Africa, where there is a recovery force standing by for just such an eventuality. If uh, something had happened between the liftoff and that point where they had uh, been high enough to uh, blow free, they would have ejected from the spacecraft in much the fashion of a fighter pilot ejecting uh, from a aircraft. Bill Stout, perhaps you and Bob Sharp out there can uh, give us some idea of what it's like to be sitting up in that yeah. spacecraft right now. I don't think we can really do that, Walter, since uh, I'm sure that Shara and Stafford are desperately unhappy at this point. But the remarkable thing that Bob was talking to me about a moment ago is that in this three-second period you talk about, and you cut that in half, three seconds between ignition and liftoff, mm -hmm. uh, Wally Shara had an option. Either he could stay with the thing, or he could eject and get out. And he chose to stay, right? Uh, yes, in this uh, area, the, uh, of course, we have a malfunction detection system on board the spacecraft that uh, both McDonnell and uh, Martin people have worked out in conjunction to analyze the uh, situations on the booster with. And uh, uh, Wally and Tom have spent hours and hours of practice on every conceivable type of malfunction that they could possibly think of in a simulator uh, practicing to do the right thing. 
Uh, one of the malfunctions which was practiced uh, was just exactly what happened here, a, uh, an automatic shutdown for the booster on the pad. And in this case, the uh, engine lights, uh, first stage engine lights on the panel will come on red and uh, <coughs> indicate a shutdown. Now, normally, if uh, this would, would have happened a fraction of a second later, after they had received a liftoff signal, it would have called for an ejection. The way they differentiate uh, a, uh, the type of action they take here, of course, is by looking at the event timer on the panel, which starts uh, counting up at liftoff. So uh, uh, Shiraz interpreted the thing correctly, uh, did nothing, did not eject, and did a perfect job in there, which uh, I think is real commendable. What do you think of people like Wally Shiraz, who can make that sort of decision in the space of perhaps a second and a half? Well, I like them. They, they're... <laughs> They're uh, real well-trained, capable individuals, and... Uh, uh, Bob, excuse me, but let's go to Paul sure. Haney here now for a second. Right. You're cleared for takeoff. voice of the astronauts as they had that ignition failure. Uh, no problem. On these tanks, is that correct? That is a firm of all tanks are venting. Your all tanks are venting, Bristol. Do you see any problems? Roger. Roger. The all tanks are venting. Bird looks good. Roger. Let's report. It looks good. Thank you. 
seen as the technicians uh, in their asbestos suits uh, work around the base of the big uh, thruster engines in the final shutdown phases of those engines, cutting fuel lines and so forth, turning them off, perhaps even beginning to look for the cause of the difficulty even before Shiraw and Stafford have been removed from the uh, spacecraft. As we heard in that conversation, uh, taped uh, shortly after the uh, shutdown of the engine, and weren't those astronauts amazingly calm up there, facing disaster, their voices were even calmer as they reported the shutdown and the potential and read out uh, their instruments uh, to the uh, blockhouse than the voices in the blockhouse themselves seemed to be. Yes. But they were shortly after uh, the engine shut down, they're told to arm the squibs and stow their D-rings. Uh, what that means is to, uh, to uh, uh, put away the equipment with which they would eject from the spacecraft, so it was assumed that they were in a, a safe position. Chuck Van Fremd to Cape Kennedy. Chuck, come in. Yes, Walter, apparently, as we've been listening uh, to the tape, uh, the villain in this piece today was what they call a tail plug, which uh, uh, is an electrical connection between the Gemini launch vehicle and the pad, which either prematurely disconnected or uh, was loose at the moment of ignition. And as a result, we've got a, uh, a four-day uh, delay again. Uh, out there on the pad uh, starting later on today once the erector is back up and the Astros are out and back down on the ground and set then the launch crews go back to work again on a 24 hour a day basis they've got to install new pre-valves and uh, they have to purge the tanks and go through the whole business of preparing the Gemini 6 booster rocket for a launch again we're told that uh, with a new target date of a, of a Thursday uh, uh, launch uh, with the attempt of Sharon Stafford to again chase and rendezvous with Borman and Lovell aboard seven that we have two launch windows one running from 734 to 759 a.m. Eastern Standard Time the other from 849 to 936 Eastern Standard Time so they do have two windows to shoot at uh, Chuck Chuck yes uh, that was information I had here too of those launch windows but did you just uh, over here uh, the uh, mission control telling uh, Borman and uh, Lovell that the launch time would be 8.43 Eastern Standard Time on Thursday. I'm I don't sorry. understand this discrepancy myself. I'm sorry, Walter, neither do I, and we'll try and check it out and get back to you with it. Right. Uh, the, the, the figures that were released by the Civilian Space Agency for a Thursday launch were 7.34 to 7.59 and from uh, 8.49 to 9.36. Right, right. Here's an announcement from Jack King. Complex 19, another problem occurred in the area when a, one of the recovery helicopters, a part of the recovery forces that were airborne at the time at the Cape, a CH-3C helicopter with five persons aboard, had a small engine fire and made an emergency landing in the Banana River. No one was injured. Two of the recovery larks, those are the large mobile vehicles that are used as part of the recovery forces, have gone to the scene. It's in the vicinity of launch pad 37 at Cape Kennedy and are in the process of recovering the pilots and the personnel aboard at the present time. Once again, no one injured. It was a CH-3C helicopter. It encountered a small fire in one of its engines, made an emergency landing in the river. Back at Complex 19, we understand that an inspection crew is on its way to the launch pad to make a quick inspection in an attempt to confirm what our data, both in the blockhouse and at Mission Control Center, showed concerning our problem at the pad. This is Gemini Launch Control. It's impossible to uh, simply uh, uh, start one of these engines again and launch 
Gemini 6 a little bit later today because of the, uh, the fact that a maximum fuel load is required and uh, a portion of that fuel was used in that one and six tenths seconds that the engines fired. Recounting again what happened this morning at precisely the right second, now, even as Gemini 7 got off on the right second, the engines ignited at 9.54 uh, this morning. At precisely that second, everything seemed to be going well. The engines fired up, and uh, the vehicle was being held on the pad for the three seconds while power built up, which is normal. But just halfway toward that three seconds, after one and six tenths seconds of the engines firing, the engines shut down. Uh, they shut down automatically, an automatic sequencer uh, turned them off so that the uh, Gemini 6 could not be launched. There were some hair-raising moments. This has never happened in our manned space program before, although the contingency had been planned for and rehearsed many times. Uh, Shaw and Stafford uh, stood by, ready to pull those large D-rings uh, on the underside of the, uh, their cockpit seats, which would eject them from the spacecraft, even as it stood on the pad, if that uh, fuel seemed to be getting away from the engines and uh, threatening an explosion on the pad. They were ready to go if they had to, but that was not necessary. And meanwhile, these two calm, skilled test pilots read out the figures on the board with no excitement whatsoever in their voices, as you heard in those tapes a few moments ago. It has been determined uh, in a preliminary survey that a tail plug became loose or disconnected, a rather simple matter to repair, but now the bird has to be refueled again, as you heard uh, Chuck Van Fremd explain uh, a few moments ago, and checked out again so it will be Thursday before apparently it can be launched. Although everything in uh, manned space these days is on a real-time basis, they can make spontaneous decisions. They could conceivably get things turned around maybe even a little bit before that. But at any rate, at the moment, they're talking about a Thursday morning launch. The exact time is in some uh, question, however. Let's see if Nelson Benton in Houston can tell us. Nelson? And the 8.43 time, 8.43 a.m. Eastern time, is the uh, start of the desirable window on Thursday. The earlier time was uh, an, an approximation, uh, perhaps, and this is speculation, that uh, we weren't really considering having to wait that long to launch. I think it should be said we should hark back to something that the mission director, William Snyder, said a few days ago. The object of this flight is not to get off on the eighth day or the ninth day or the tenth day. The real object is rendezvous and I think we can say that that's uh, still a distinct uh, possibility, uh, we hope, a probability. Waller? It also should be pointed out that uh, the Gemini 6 uh, rendezvous with Gemini 7 was a flight unto itself. Meanwhile, Gemini 7 is doing perfectly, and uh, that flight uh, is uh, proving out everything they had hoped to prove out so far. It is in its uh, eighth day, and in another uh, couple of hours, three hours, I think, exactly, it will pass the record Cooper and Conrad flight of 190 hours. The Gemini uh, uh, 7 is now in its 118th orbit of the Earth. Wally Shira, this 42-year-old Annapolis graduate and test pilot, a man whose father was a barnstorming pilot after a distinguished World War I flying record, uh, well, Shira was just as cool and as collected in that uh, Gemini spacecraft uh, facing dire emergency this morning as any man could possibly be. And in that uh, first exchange of messages, just as soon as they had read out all the figures and uh, they'd been given all, they'd been uh, giving all the information to the blockhouse, a good test pilot does that even if his ship is crashing uh, about him. Uh, he reads out all the figures so that uh, the next man will know what happened at any rate. Shira was doing his job right down to the moment when it looked uh, like everything was finally safe. Here is a picture of that uh, engine again. Those uh, two thrust chambers of the uh, Titan engine, uh, Aerojet engines, which develop some 430,000 pounds of thrust. They're still looking them over, deciding when it'll be safe to put the erector back up and bring uh, Shira and Stafford back to the ground. 
But Chiral, just as soon as they were able to exchange a little bit of banter and they didn't have to read out those engines anymore, uh, those uh, monitoring devices uh, in the cockpit said, well, those things happen. It could happen to anyone. Uh, no one was hurt. And then he uh, said that they wanted to keep on trying, that, uh, and he had a kind word for the boys on the ground at the moment when he must have been uh, feeling the utmost disappointment, uh, he gave them a little pat on the back and said, you did your best. Uh, and then he assured them that Shira and Stafford still want to go in pursuit of Germany 7. They were disappointed on October 25th when they got within 40 minutes of launch and uh, learned that the Agena target vehicle they were going to be pursuing on that mission had blown up before going into orbit. Today, the Gemini 7 target vehicle, which identified itself uh, over Bermuda a little later on, over the Azores, as it uh, passed over the Cape. And the amazing thing was that Borman and Lovell from Gemini... Six, uh, clearing the way for the erector to go up again and to get uh, Shira and Stafford out and also beginning to assess whatever damage might have been done by that uh, one and a half second firing of the engines as to what is going to be required to get this bird ready to go by Thursday morning. As von Fremd has told us from the Cape, uh, a lot of normal things have to be done even if there's nothing to be repaired. Uh, the purging of the tanks, that is the emptying of all the fuel, and then the refilling of those tanks, uh, the checkout of the uh, various electronic components, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, a full, <coughs> full recount of the uh, vehicle getting ready for a Thursday morning launch, which we're told will come at 8.43 a.m. These launch windows, you know, uh, uh, they call them windows. That's the small time span uh, during the 24 hours when a launch from uh, pad 19 uh, can put uh, a, a spacecraft into a uh, close enough position to still catch up with uh, its mate up there in the sky. CBS News coverage of Gemini 7, two weeks in space, will continue in a moment after station identification. This is CBS. Project Gemini, two weeks in space. Again from the CBS News Space Center in New York, Walter Cronkite. We said when we came on the air about an hour and 40 minutes ago that this was destined to be one of the dramatic days in space. It has turned out to be one of the dramatic days on the ground at Cape Kennedy. For the first time in our manned space program, engines were ignited and shut down before the spacecraft took off from the pad. This happened uh, just about an hour and 45 minutes ago, or rather 45 minutes ago, excuse me, at 9.54, uh, right at the second when Gemini 6 was scheduled to blast off to pursue uh, in a 103,000 mile chase, 17,500 miles an hour, Gemini 7 through the skies and achieve a rendezvous at 185 miles high. At that moment at 9.54, the engines ignited as planned. The countdown had been perfect, but one and six tenths seconds after those engines ignited, they shut down automatically. A safety device built into the, uh, the spacecraft, uh, into the booster, had uh, shut the engines down because there was something wrong that would have jeopardized the flight in its powered phase in the first six minutes before the spacecraft went into orbit. We never had such a shutdown before, and it was a critically dangerous moment. They Astronauts had drilled for the moment. They were prepared. They were, we can assume, uh, while they read out the figures in such calm voices, it's unbelievable to the ground as to what was happening to their engines. They were, we can assume, uh, grabbing that large orange ring under their seats, which if they had pulled them, would have ejected them from the uh, spacecraft right there at the pad, thrown them some 150, 200 feet high, they'd come down by parachutes, so it would have been a uh, first for uh, uh, that kind of a pad aboard. Instead, they were able to stay aboard the spacecraft to read out those figures. The engines uh, were drained and still are being drained of their uh, critically dangerous fuel uh, so that the erector now can be put back up 
and Wally Shira and Tom Stafford can be brought safely back to Earth. The mission has been scrubbed for today and for the next three days, apparently. A target time has been set for 8.43 a.m. on Thursday morning for Gemini 6 to be turned around and to go. It is believed that the cause of the shutdown was a loose tail pipe, a tail plug, that is, uh, in the, uh, at the bottom of the booster, uh, which was signaled to the automatic sequencer. It said something's wrong, and the automatic sequencer shut down the engines. If that uh, is all that is the matter, uh, it is a simple matter to correct, of course, to just to be sure that that pipe is on a little tighter the uh, next time. But uh, as we've been told by Chuck Van Fremd at the Cape, there are a lot of procedures now to get Gemini 6 ready again. All of this uh, set of fuel has to be drained. Uh, the tanks have to be refueled. The electronic equipment has to be uh, rechecked out. CBS News coverage of Gemini 6 and 7 will continue in a moment. Jim King at uh, the Cape is giving us a report. Let's listen. Engine shut down this morning. Our next attempt, the earliest attempt, will be on Thursday, which is L plus 12 days as far as the Gemini 7 mission, uh, the combined Gemini 7 6 missions are concerned. On that date, we will have one launch window. That launch window will begin at 8.43 a.m. Eastern Standard Time and last for 47 minutes. On the 13th day, L plus 13 days from the Gemini 7 launch, and that would be next Friday, two windows are available. Uh, one starting at 7.14 a.m. Eastern Standard Time and the second at 8.49 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The duration of both of these windows on that 13th day will be 47 minutes. We will have a press conference at press site number two following uh, egress of the astronauts at Launch Complex 19. The project people will be over to see the press after they are sure that astronauts Wally Sharar and Tom Stafford have safely egressed from the spacecraft. We're expecting that the erector will be coming up shortly. It may be a matter of five or ten minutes from this time. This is Gemini Launch Control. Five or ten minutes uh, would mean uh, that that director will be uh, raised again around the spacecraft just about one hour after the abortive uh, ignition. The ignition which came precisely at the second it was scheduled to 9.54, uh, but had to be shut down. Now here's Bill Stout at the McDonald plant in St. Louis. I think the big question, Walter, is exactly what they're doing in there besides being unhappy. Bob, can you tell us uh, what they have to do at this point? Uh, not too much of anything. They've uh, stowed their D-rings and uh, we heard that they turned off their spacecraft batteries, so uh, the power in there to their environmental control system fans is probably being provided by the uh, uh, ground complex. So what normally would have been a real busy time for them at, at this time is a uh, real uh, uh, easy one. You're sitting back and uh, waiting for the uh, 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 tower or the gantry to be uh, erected again. The D-ring is the ejection pull. Hmm? Uh, yes, for their uh, to uh, eject their seat. Were uh, they actually, do you think, in that one or two second period between the beginning of ignition and the shutdown scrubbing of the mission, were they actually sitting there holding something in the way of an ejection pull, wondering whether they had to use it, or is that automatic? Uh, no, it's uh, initiated by the uh, command pilot. So. Uh, while he was holding on to the uh, D-ring on his seat, ready to eject. And uh, the thing that really impresses me, uh, after the, the training and the familiarity with the uh, design of this malfunction detection system on board, is the analysis that Wally made there in a uh, fraction of a second. Evidently, when the uh, plug fell out, and it must have started his event timer, which ordinarily would have signaled liftoff, but he was still able to discriminate that uh, a liftoff had not occurred, either by the premature starting of the event timer or possibly by the fact that there was no uh, apparent motion to the spacecraft. Anyway, in this uh, length of time, his training and uh, skill paid off. He made a tremendous decision there, and it was right. In the space of one and a half or two seconds. That's the kind of man to fly with, Walter, a man who can think that quickly. 
and apparently Sharon did it again today. Would you like to talk to Bob about some of this, Walter? I'm not sure that uh, all the audio is coming through. Uh, coming through uh, loud and clear, Bill, and uh, very helpful again, Bob, uh, to tell us uh, what happened. Uh, this boy, Shara, is certainly a whale of a test pilot. Uh, you know, he, he, had a, uh, he had a case out on the coast once when uh, he fired off a, a missile from a, uh, from a fighter airplane, and the missile chased him uh, over most of California for quite a long while. Uh, he took every, just absolutely the right action, evasive action, to avoid being chased down and uh, hit by his own missile. Uh, He's, uh, he's certainly had his share of experiences in aircraft and in uh, spacecraft. He flew the, uh, the Sigma 7 on what was the real textbook mission, as the astronauts and the space people, test pilots call it. Everything went absolutely uh, perfectly on that flight. Everything was done perfectly. The missions were accomplished perfectly. He ended up landing closer than any of the astronauts had yet uh, to their recovery vehicle. He was just four miles off from the Kearsarge uh, out in the Pacific. Uh, Wallace Sherrod deserves a great deal of credit. He's the oldest of the active astronauts these days at 42, a native of Oradell, New Jersey, uh, where he had quite an adventurous boyhood, too. Uh, well, I think it was uh, Dave Shoemacher remarked earlier he was called Raw Raw. Uh, Raw Raw Shara uh, was the title they gave him at the Naval Academy, from which he graduated in 45. These are the men working at the base of the spacecraft, uh, the base of the booster. Do you see those two thrust chambers? Yeah, uh, in there, so they can walk under there. What's that, Bob? Uh, I think that's a uh, iron grill, about like some of the uh, grills over the elevators on sidewalks, so that people can walk uh, in that area. Good. Bob, could you <laughs> say where in that uh, complex uh, that tail plug would be, uh, uh, where it connects? Uh, no, I don't know. I've seen the umbilical, of course, up on the spacecraft on the bottom side of it, and I believe there's another one higher up on the booster, but uh, I don't know where the one is down there. Yeah. I don't recall either. Incidentally, uh, we were talking about the possibility of pad damage. There really isn't very much, uh, I'm advised, from the Cape in this kind of a shutdown, because until the uh, booster lifts off, it's setting there on a great bucket, in effect, a great hole in the ground, a reinforced concrete bucket and flame uh, diverter that, uh, that sends the flame out along a, a path away from the, the critical parts of the pad. It's not until the booster actually lifts off of the pad and those flames begin to sear the base of the erector and uh, along the entire umbilical tower that any damage can really take place to the pad. So there's not a problem of pad damage, apparently, in turning around the bird now for a Thursday launch. Bob, are you uh, immediately acquainted with uh, how much checkout procedure is going to be required to uh, get this thing in shape for Thursday? Uh, no, not really. Uh, I would say the spacecraft should still be in, uh, in pretty good shape there. Uh, the batteries have, uh, I believe it's about a 30-day lifetime, so I doubt if it will be anything that will require spacecraft emating. Uh, uh, I just don't really know at this time uh, exactly what the troubles are there or what the damage uh, may be. Of course, all of the electrical interfaces, that is the area between the mating, uh, between the spacecraft and the booster, have all been tested out. They won't have to go through further tests, I don't suppose, will they? No, I sure wouldn't think so. Uh, again, the flame started, uh, of course, from the uh, booster when it ignited down in the pad, and it may, uh, may be that they'll have to refurbish the pad uh, again, uh, much as the same, uh, in the same manner as they did before the, uh, uh, since the last liftoff. Well, I think, Bob, uh, they were just, we were just talking to the Cape about that, uh, and uh, the, the general feeling is that since there was no actual liftoff, there probably hadn't been any damage to the pad. That uh, the flame uh, uh, goes right out the so-called flame bucket there and uh, hasn't had a chance to sear 
either the erector or the umbilical to, uh, tower. Of course, there still could be something to be done, I suppose, but the boss of that pad, the mayor of pad 19, he's called, uh, certainly will do whatever's required to get it ready. Uh, we, were uh, we were told that the erector probably would be coming up about this moment. Uh, that was a very rough approximation by Jack King, the voice of mission control at the Cape. We do not see any evidence that the uh, erector has started up yet. As a matter of fact, it would not, with, uh, I would assume, with those men still working at the base of the rocket, and we saw that they were there just a moment ago. Recounting what happened this morning at uh, just 58 minutes ago, we had uh, the most dramatic series of events on the pad uh, since, I guess, Alan Shepard first lifted off into space uh, when this Gemini 6 Titan II uh, Aerojet engine uh, started right on the precise second, but ran just one and six tenths seconds before automatically shutting down for the safety of the flight, uh, a one and four tenths seconds before it should have built up enough power to uh, release itself from the pad and begin uh, the scheduled flight of today. Instead, it shut down. And we had some, uh, some critically uh, uh, breathtaking moments as we waited to be sure that uh, the engines were going to shut down completely, that fuel was not going to pour through those lines and cause a possible explosion on the pad. Up in uh, the spacecraft, uh, Wally Shira and Tom Stafford sat ready to eject uh, from the spacecraft even as it stood on the pad if that should be necessary. Uh, it was not necessary and those two very calm pilots read out uh, the figures as they showed in their monitoring it seemed even cooler than did the men in the blockhouse uh, itself. Now they wait uh, to be relieved uh, uh, from their uh, spacecraft. The hatches were closed a uh, little over uh, two hours ago and they're certainly anxious to uh, get out of there now. They've been disappointed for the second time in this flight of Gemini 6. Last October 25th, 40 minutes before they were due to blast off, and after they had been, uh, the hatches closed, they've been locked into their spacecraft, uh, they were told that the uh, Gina target vehicle, the unmanned vehicle, had uh, blown up before it uh, got into orbit. Today, uh, the trouble was with their vehicle there on the ground. And this time, uh, the astronauts Borman and Lovell overhead in Gemini 7 uh, were told that uh, the flight of Gemini 6 in pursuit would not occur today, but they were told it would come probably on Thursday, or will be rescheduled at any rate for Thursday, 8.43 a.m. takeoff. Borman and Lovell concerned about the, their comrades on the ground, and as uh, they saw the ignition start and then shut down, they were most fearful. They saw that from above the Cape. By the time they got to the Canary Islands, they were able to be informed everything was all right. Now let's go to Gemini Control. Meanwhile, down at the Cape, resting and estimating another 20 to 30 minutes before Wally Chiron, Tom Stafford leave six. Meanwhile, a few minutes ago, as Seven sailed over the Carnarvon station, the conversation went like this.
night. Seven goes merrily on its way. That was a recorded uh, tape of conversation as Gemini Seven got its uh, first uh, updating of uh, missions and times since the failure of Gemini Six to get off at 9.54. 9.54 was the scheduled time. We had ignition, uh, but then an automatic shutdown one and a half seconds later. And uh, now Shira and Stafford still wait in their spacecraft for the erector to be raised so that they can come back to Earth for the second time disappointed in their flight. That erector is scheduled now to go up in about 15 minutes. Gemini 7, as we said, uh, meanwhile continues to whirl around and will be up four days more until uh, the now scheduled rendezvous on Thursday. They have already established several firsts in space. In another uh, two and a half hours, they will have been up longer than any men have before. That was uh, Gordon Cooper and Pete Conrad in August, 190 hours. They will pass that at about 1.30 this afternoon. Meanwhile, they've already, for the first time, uh, kept station with their booster, it's called. That is, after they were launched last Saturday, they turned around and maneuvered uh, their Gemini 7 spacecraft so they could keep the booster uh, just a few hundred feet away for almost one complete orbit. For the first time, they have flown in an underwear environment. Uh, Jim Lovell uh, went in, got in uh, out of his uh, spacesuit uh, on uh, Sunday, the day after the uh, launch, and stayed out of it until yesterday when uh, he put the suit back on so command pilot Frank Borman could take off his suit and uh, fly around in his underwear find it much more comfortable. Both of them said it's, uh, it's the way to fly. Uh, they do not want uh, the uh, mission control, both of the men, to get into uh, the underwear at the same time. They want one man always capable of immediately reinflating or inflating his suit if there should be any failure of the spacecraft. Uh, one of them will be able to work to bring it back. They also have, for the first time, navigated by the stars in a major orbital change, uh, getting Arcturus, the star Arcturus, uh, perfectly in line and uh, maneuvering uh, toward it, in a sense, in order to make uh, the orbital change. And they got congratulations from the ground for that first celestial navigation feat. Also, I suppose it should be recorded to the first sneeze in space has been accredited to Gemini 7. Uh, Frank Borman uh, sneezed a couple of times on Wednesday night, gave a little concern to the tracking station that heard him, but uh, Dr. Barry said it uh, wasn't of any great import. The only problem they really had up there is, is breathing this pure 100 degree, 100% 100 oxygen. Uh, their nasal and throat passages have dried out, which was somewhat expected. They're using ointment, but they're not taking any medication for that as yet. CBS News coverage of Gemini 6 and 7 will continue. This is Walter Cronkite back at our CBS News Space Center. 
where we have reported this morning the dramatic moment of pad 19. As uh, at the precise second of uh, ignition, the engines of Gemini 6 fired up but were shut down one and a half seconds later because of what apparently was a loose tail plug. Uh, that uh, would not take very much fixing, but the Gemini 6 itself will have to be uh, refueled. Uh, the Titan Booster 4 it will. And that will take uh, all of that turnaround till probably Thursday morning. Also checking out to be sure that it was the tail plug that caused the difficulty this morning. Meanwhile, the potential danger of an explosion on that pad uh, was met by Sherraw and Stafford with uh, the uh, calm of a, uh, of a uh, couple of uh, boys going to Sunday school on this morning. Speaking of Sunday school, uh, one of our colleagues reminds us that only three major launches have been scheduled on Sunday since our space program began, and all three of them have been failures. A Venus shot and a Mariner shot were scheduled on Sunday and uh, failed, and uh, now our Gemini 6 scheduled on a Sunday failed to uh, get up. The, uh, uh, meanwhile, we're waiting uh, for that erector to, be, to go up and to get uh, Shara and Stafford safely back to Earth. Until that time comes, we don't intend to uh, leave the air. We want to see them get back uh, safely. Uh, those uh, two pilots, <coughs> Shara, a 42-year-old uh, Navy captain, and, uh, and Stafford, a 35-year-old uh, Air Force major, uh, did an excellent job this morning. But as we've told you, even while they were having their difficulties up there, they were concerned about the disappointment on the ground and told the ground crews they did the best they could and that while they were disappointed, they were ready to go again. We've been talking this morning about the window uh, that uh, opens for these flights for rendezvous, the window of 47 minutes. That's based on a, uh, uh, the fact that, of course, every few seconds that flight is delayed and takeoff, uh, that uh, target vehicle is getting a little further around the world. It comes back, of course, in a short order, but not quite on the path it was before. So every time you miss an orbit, uh, you've got to do some readjusting to, to catch it in the next orbit. And after uh, three orbits, uh, the spacecraft that you're going after is so far away, it's uh, missing some of the tracking stations. So what they plan is they would like to get up within 300 seconds, but every 100 seconds, uh, the delay means one orbit delay in making the rendezvous. And after 300 seconds, that track is so wide apart uh, that uh, they prefer to wait 24 hours. They would put the spacecraft up, Gemini 6, but it would go around 24 hours before attempting the rendezvous. There's a 35-minute pad in there to do that kind of uh, recalculating, and then an extra 12 minutes to add up to the 47, in which they would, by a, a considerable change in the direction of powered flight, while the spacecraft and the Titan booster all together uh, make corrections in the orbit to make uh, rendezvous. That's why a 47-minute window. The uh, men who fly this complicated and fascinating mission uh, uh, would be the same two astronauts who, of course, were disappointed on October 25th when their flight was scrubbed because of the explosion of the Agena target vehicle. Captain Wally Shara of the Navy, the command pilot, has been up there in space before. He flew six orbits three years ago in his Mercury Sigma 7, but his pilot, Air Force Major Thomas Stafford, is a newcomer to space. And now, Dave Dugan traces the background of these men, starting on common ground for the astronauts, the Naval Academy at Annapolis, Maryland. Both Wally Shara and Tom Stafford are alumni of the Naval Academy. But until they met in the astronaut program, that's about all they had in common. Shara graduated in 1945 in a wartime speed-up course. In his yearbook, it says he could make anyone laugh, even at Reveille. And that's one of his outstanding traits, a joyous appreciation of life. His boyhood was spent in the small town of Oradell, New Jersey, which is named a small park in his honor. He lived around the corner from this country store in a house on a street lined with maples. After attending the local school in Oradell, he went to the Dwight Morrow High School in nearby Englewood, where Leo Gordon was his guidance counselor. Wally was, in academics, a boy who would do just enough to get B or B-plus grades. He never wanted to be the top scholar. 
He wanted to be mixed into all of the activities of the school. He had a personality that was radiant. He was well liked by everybody. I never saw Wally at any time sulking or uh, being critical of anything in the school. Wally's parents now live in San Diego. His father has retired after a full life as an engineer with the Air Force in the Far East and as a pilot in World War I. Before Wally was born, his parents barnstormed through New Jersey in this light plane. Mr. Shira told us how his wife was a pioneer at walking in space. We were down in, uh, I think it was Hamilton, I'm not sure, and uh, we're trying to get people to uh, become passengers, you know, the dollar a minute it was. And nobody seemed to... Mr. Shira told us how his wife was a pioneer at walking in space. We were down in, uh, I think it was Hamilton, I'm not sure, and uh, we're trying to get people to uh, become passengers, you know, the dollar a minute it was. And nobody seemed to be interested, so uh, there were a lot of people out there all watching us, you know, make a landing and take off again, fly around, come back. And, so I decided, well, uh, they were afraid, uh, so I asked her to walk the wings, see? You didn't ask me, you just said, climb over and get out there and hang on. Mm. <laughs> Wasn't this a little dangerous, Mrs. Sherrod? I didn't think anything about it. Uh, I had been flying with Mr. Sherrod quite a bit, and I'd helped him, different things went wrong with the plane, and we'd work on it together, getting it running again, and. So I, I knew it pretty well, and I knew just where to step. And I just climbed over the side and stayed right there in the middle on the, the certain part there. I didn't step on the linen part. Strut, and uh, yeah. I just held on to the struts. The beam. Mm. And that, then I climbed back in. And of course, everybody thought, well, if she'll get out and do that, it's safe enough to take a ride. Oh, sure. So then we were just rushed with customers. Some people might wonder if a, a, a mother of an astronaut might be worried or concerned, but I guess any mother who got out on the wing of an airplane and didn't act like that. Uh... Oh, don't worry, a mother's different. <laughs> oh, it was different? Yes, I wasn't a mother then. And uh, a mother's always concerned about her children. The picture the Shiraz painted was of an easy, relaxed time around that house in New Jersey. He's smart, he was then. And while I used to help him once in a while with his algebra and so on, those things, I, uh, he didn't need too much help. He was a good boy, anyway. He loves, just loves music. And the moment he comes in this house now, why, the music, his dear is nice stereo. He has stereo in every room, and there's always music in the house. And he loves art. He loves literature. Uh, which I think is unusual for someone with a technical background. But he, he satisfied me fine. He, I enjoyed him as a son. He was mischievous, but I enjoyed that too. Well, uh, could you, how mischievous was he, Mrs. Sherrard? Very. <laughs> <laughs> Wally, who was already a veteran of space travel, named his Mercury capsule Sigma-7 to honor the engineers of space flight. He had planned to become an aeronautical engineer, but instead he became a Navy flyer who downed a MiG in Korea. Bill Stout asked whether he wouldn't prefer to be fighting today in Vietnam. It's a, a different kind of challenge, but it's one I wanted and accepted in the past. I feel that uh, the action that's going on in Vietnam, of course, is what I was trained so completely for when I, in turn, was in combat in Korea. At this point in time, I'm much better trained to do the job I'm doing. Wally is married to the former Joe Fraser of Seattle. They have a son, Wally III, and a daughter, Susie. Even though you've been there before, uh, how do the members of the Shira family feel about the coming flight? I'm sure that there's always a degree of apprehension. I hope there's not fear. I hope to dispel fear by dispelling ignorance. And if I can explain what we're doing on this mission, satisfactory to you and our audience, and possibly you know that's what I've been trying to do for my family, to make them aware of what I am doing. 
Pilot Tom Stafford is a 1952 graduate of Annapolis, a letterman in football who graduated number 50 in a class of 783. In his yearbook, it says, in the afternoon, you can find him in his room lifting weights to keep in shape. This devotion to physical fitness and hygiene has won him the nickname among the astronauts of Mr. Clean. Stafford's boyhood was spent in the prairie town of Weatherford, Oklahoma, where he now shares billing with the local college. He went all through school in Weatherford, lived there until he went away to Annapolis, the Air Force, and the space program. He even served briefly in the Weatherford National Guard. Three of the school chums still live in Weatherford. One of them runs an automobile agency, another sells insurance, and Stony Lockstone, his closest friend in Weatherford, helps his father run a funeral home. I would say that he could, could knock you off your feet one minute and uh, seem like a meek, tender lamb the next. He's just that kind of a guy. Mrs. Spann was his mathematics teacher in high school. She's credited with being one of the most influential teachers in his life. Oh, he got in his top. Uh, he uh, took part in all of the activities in school, and he was a, a regular on the football team, and uh, uh, he was uh, a, a helper in the office. That is, he helped down in the physics lab and the science lab and had access to that. So during his spare time, he worked on little experiments down there. And uh, um, well, he was a curious kind of a boy. And um, I think that uh, all of those things helped to further his interest in the things that he's doing now. Stafford's mother lives in the same house in Weatherford where Tom grew up. She was widowed the same year Tom graduated from high school. She told us about her son as a little boy. Yes, so he always had a desire to climb. As uh, a matter of fact, when uh, he was just uh, mere, not much more than a baby, uh, we lived uh, near a telephone line, and the Mallory's lived back of us. And he was simply intrigued by seeing him climb the poles. And one day I said to him, uh, uh, he'd done something naughty. I said, Thomas, don't you want to be a little gentleman? He says, oh no, I want to be a telephone man so I can climb high. Did he always have an adventuresome spirit like that? Yes, he, he liked to try something new. Does he talk to you about going to the moon? Is that his uh, big ambition? Oh yes, that's one of his great ambitions. Well, what does he say to you about it? Well, he has it all figured out scientifically, how it can be done safely. And yeah, what do you think about that? Does it uh, seem sort of unbelievable? Uh, it's too technical for me to quite understand all the technicalities of it. So I just, uh, I'm just leaving that up to him and God. Tom met his wife in high school, he played football, and she was the football queen. Her name then was Faye Shoemaker. The Staffords now have two little girls, Diane and Karen. Stafford talked to Bill Stout about space and his family. Major, this is to be your first trip into space. Um, what is the feeling of your family about it? Well, the wife and the two daughters are both uh, looking forward uh, for the flight, and uh, say they're very anxious to see me fly. No apprehension? None whatsoever. You've flown aircraft for a long time. Perhaps they're used to it, or have you tried to explain to them? What well, I, I think it's a um, big phasing in and acclimation. Uh, I've flew fighters for approximately five years in the Air Force, then went to the experimental flight test pilot school, was stationed at Edwards for four years, and then came on board this program. So it's, it's been a complete evolution for the family as well as myself. A report, a little biography of Tom Stafford, the pilot, and Wally Shira, the command pilot of Gemini 6, which did not get off this morning as scheduled at 9.54. Ignition took place in the engines, but uh, it had the engines had to be shut down before the liftoff, and the mission has been rescheduled for Thursday at 8.43 a.m. We are waiting uh, here on the air to watch uh, the erector go back up around that spacecraft and to see Shira and Stafford brought safely back to Earth. CBS News coverage of Gemini 6 and 7 will continue in a moment. A man with a tough beard often has sensitive skin. 
He needs a shaver gentle enough to shave the fuzz off a peach, yet powerful enough to go through hard bristles. The new Remington shavers do both. That's why they cost a bit more. The Remington works on a completely different system. Quieter in your hand, smoother on your face. No skipping, no jumping. Just the smoothest, closest shave you've ever had. Remington, the shaver gentle enough to shave a peach, yet powerful enough to shave a brush, makes a peachy gift for a man. They shave with or without a cord. See the new Remington shavers that shave the peach and the brush at your local dealer. Order Cronkite back at our CBS News Space Center from which we've been reporting this dramatic day at Pad 19, the uh, scrub of Mission Gemini 6 until next Thursday because of a shutdown of its engines even as it stood there on the pad. A moment ago we mentioned to you that some of our most important launches that have been scheduled for Sunday have failed. One, of course, did succeed, Ranger 9, went off on Sunday, March 21st. That one did get those magnificent live pictures of the moon. Chuck Van Fremd at Cape Kennedy. How do things look there, Chuck? What's delaying the uh, lifting of that erector? Do you have any idea? Walter, no ideas on why the delay on, on the erector. I imagine, Jay, they just want to make darn sure that things are okay out there on the pad. I don't think there's anything really significant in it. What is concerning a lot of people down here right now is whether the civilian space agency officials in charge of this launch may decide they want another sim flight, a simulated flight in which they uh, check out uh, the spacecraft and booster together. If they do decide they want a sim flight before they again commit Gemini 6 to launch, that would almost have to take place tomorrow in order to meet the um, uh, anticipated flight uh, next Thursday. Uh, we still have a lot of questions that uh, need answering down here at this time. You know, I was thinking back uh, just watching that interview with uh, that Dave Dugan had with uh, the Shira and Stafford parents. A couple of things uh, I think uh, people might be interested in. One, that uh, uh, Mrs. Shira did not mention the fact that she was grounded because she was uh, anticipating the arrival of Wally. That was uh, her last wing-walking experience. And uh, also... Uh, Looking at Tom Stafford, the 35-year-old co-pilot, Shira likes to joke down here saying as command pilot it was his prerogative to pick his own uh, co-pilot, and he picked uh, Stafford because Stafford uh, has an obvious lack of hair, and he is seven years younger, and because Wally has a full patch of hair, why that made him feel younger. Uh, they're still out there at uh, pad 19 right now, uh, checking the wires at the base of the pad at the booster before they're going to raise the erector. We still expect this to take place uh, very shortly. At this point, Wally Sharon, Tom Stafford, uh, obviously two disappointed men are also getting tired of just sitting up there on, on top of that Titan II booster rocket. Walter? They've been in that spacecraft since 8 o'clock. That's uh, three hours and 12. The, the, the seats in the space capsule are most uncomfortable uh, when the capsule is on the ground, not in a weightless state, in other words. They actually form something of a V, that is, the back is bent forward a little bit. You sit in this position, and it's pretty hard to sit there uh, for a very long time. The back gets terribly tired, particularly with that uh, uh, rather cumbersome uh, space suit on. The reason the seat is made in that form is because it has been determined that the body can best take the tremendous uh, g-forces of rapid acceleration and deceleration the spacecraft goes through when it is fitted into the seat in that fashion rather than lying back even more uh, of course uh, when the plane is in when the spacecraft's in orbit uh, this does not apply because then the weightless state the body is floating free and is simply restrained in the seat by uh, by uh, belts and uh, other webbing gemini uh, 7 is now just completing its 119th revolution, just passing over the coast of uh, Lower California and will be back uh, over the Cape uh, very shortly now, as you can see from our Colesman orbital map. The Gemini 7 flight at 1.26, just two hours and uh, three, four minutes from now, 
will set a new space record. It already has exceeded the best the Russians have been able to do, but then there's the erector going up at pad 19. The erector uh, going uh, to, to be put back into position, uh, the white room again enclosing uh, the uh, spacecraft so that uh, Sarah and uh, Stafford can step back out and into the elevator to come back to uh, Earth, disappointed, of course, that their Gemini 6 mission had to be scrubbed and uh, at the same time undoubtedly somewhat relieved that, first of all, they escaped uh, disaster when that engine did fire for a short burst, and second of all, as test pilots undoubtedly happy that they and their ground crew performed so magnificently in uh, a potentially dangerous situation. Uh, everybody apparently did their job just exactly as they had trained for it uh, in the face of this problem. The erector will be up uh, and around the uh, spacecraft in another five uh, or ten minutes and ready to recover Shara and Stafford. Meanwhile, Gemini 7 goes on, as we say, and perhaps uh, with this clear air, they will be able to even see the surrector going back up. I don't know whether they get that good a view or not, but they did see the ignition when they passed over two orbits ago. Oh, just one orbit ago, I guess. There, they will be just about over the uh, pad 19 in another three minutes. And now an announcement from uh, Gemini Control at the Cape, Jack Kent. This is Gemini Launch Control at the Cape. The 183-foot erector at Launch Complex 19 is now being raised back to its position uh, in closing the launch vehicle. As soon as the erector is fixed in place, the Gemini 6 pilots, Wally Shara and Tom Stafford, will leave the spacecraft. We are still on minimum conditions at Launch Complex 19. That is, we have a small crew near the pad making an assessment of our situation. A minimum crew also will be permitted to go up into the white room once the erector is in place to assist the astronauts on departing from the spacecraft. We expect that Chira and Stafford should be out some 10 to 15 minutes from now. We will now switch to the Mission Control Center in Houston. This is Houston. The spacecraft is directly over Houston right now and the crew has just performed another fuel cell purge. Everything looks fine aboard Gemini 7. And uh, let's stand by there to see if we can get some conversation from 7. Uh, they're in the process of raising the erector at the Cape at this time. Thank you. Very good. Hello. 
Texas, we're going prime for voice. Gemini 7, Houston. Go ahead, Houston. Have flight plan update when you're ready to copy. MSC four one nine zero two seven zero zero sequence zero one. Mode this is a picture from our camera one. in the erector. As the erector two comes up alongside of the Titan spacecraft, or the Gemini spacecraft, in the scene you see here from the distant camera. And we're listening to uh, the voice of astronauts in Germany 7 reporting to Houston as they're overhead. And this is a White Sands Pass. However, it is a very good White Sands Pass. It'll be the, about the closest one we've had, and the weather there is clear. Roger, I understand, and they check their board setting over. Uh, supposedly they have, and they're ready to go. Thank you. Okay, next item. 190 4000. Zero, zero, zero. This tape is being delayed uh, shortly. That was a report uh, as they came over the coast of Southern California talking about uh, a pass over White Sands Proving Ground where they hope to make a contact with the laser communications beam. We'll tell you more about that later. Heat period. MSC 2 and 3. 19050. Zero, Zero, zero. Sequence, zero, two. Same time as the start of each period. And this is that uh, picture from the uh, White Room as the, uh, as the Erector and the White Room close around the Gemini spacecraft inside there. Shira and Stafford have been there now three and a half hours and who an hour and 36 minutes ago, had that great booster light up below them, only to shut down one and a half seconds later, automatically, when it, something went wrong in the system. And the safety uh, uh, precautions took over, and the engine shut down. What went wrong in preliminary analysis seems to be a loose tail plug, which won't require very much to fix, but meanwhile, the Gemini will have to be refueled, and the mission has been set for Thursday morning, 8.43 a.m. Very shortly now, the elevator will be going up there with technicians to bring Shira and Stafford back. We have been listening to to Borman and Lovell in Gemini 7 as they passed over the United States and they were reporting that the weather was apparently the best they have had yet to attempt to, uh, the, to, attempt to establish communications through a laser beam, a light beam from the spacecraft. And there are the first uh, technicians up in the, the white room. They will begin to, they're waving, uh, shaking their head and uh, waving in to Shira who's on the left side of that white line you see down the center of the spacecraft. I think those signs were reversed there. Shira should be on the left. Stafford on the right. There, that's it. Uh, Shira is the command pilot, Stafford the pilot. And there, the bolts have been uh, taken off and Stafford is pushing open his door three hours and 32 minutes after he entered that spacecraft. And there is Shiraz's door. These two magnificently skilled and trained test pilots who did everything exactly right in time of serious emergency today. They did not eject from that spacecraft, a dangerous procedure at best, but far less dangerous than staying with the spacecraft if those engines had exploded. But as we heard Bob Sharp at St. Louis tell us earlier, 
He read every indication right in the split second he had and elected not to pull his D-ring, which would have blown he and his co-pilot Stafford out of that spacecraft into the sky for a parachute landing. That system has been tested with dummies, not with live astronauts, and uh, they weren't anxious to test it today, but as we said, it's far better than what might be worse. Sharon Stafford disconnecting the various plugs that uh, connect their biomedical sensors and their oxygen system. And now Stafford, Tom Stafford, 35, Annapolis graduate, class of 52, emerging from the spacecraft. Wally Shira, Annapolis 45, 42 years old, command pilot climbing out of that spacecraft for the second time. This happened to them October 25th when their Gemini target vehicle blew up. There's Wally Shira. through an experience today that none of our astronauts have gone through before in the four years of our manned space program since Alan Shepard first blasted off of Cape Canaveral then atop a Redstone rocket for a 15-minute suborbital flight downrange. Get a good look there of Stafford and now Shira. As they go back toward the elevator, a couple of disappointed astronauts. As they descend in the elevator, we expect to hear from Jack King at Mission Control, Cape Kennedy. This is Gemini Launch Control at the Cape. Astronauts Wally Shira and Tom Stafford are now out of the Gemini 6 spacecraft. They were helped out of the over the hatch at 33 minutes past the hour. It is expected that shortly after they get, go down the elevator, they will get back to the crew quarters as soon as possible. Uh, we are still looking over our condition at Launch Complex 19. We expect that we will be able to start a news conference some 30 to 40 minutes from this time. This is Gemini Launch Control. And there at the foot of the pad, uh, the foot of the erector on the pad 19, stands the trailer, which will take astronauts Shira and Stafford <clears throat> back to their crew quarters over on Merritt Island a few miles distant. That uh, connect their biomedical sensors and their oxygen system. And now Stafford, Tom Stafford, 35, Annapolis graduate, Class of 52, emerging from the spacecraft. Wally Shira, Annapolis 45, 42 years old, command pilot. Climbing out of that spacecraft for the second time. This happened to them October 25th when their Gemini target vehicle blew up. Shira. They went through an experience today that none of our astronauts have gone through before in the four years of our manned space program since Alan Shepard first blasted off of Cape Canaveral then atop a Redstone rocket for a 15-minute suborbital flight down range. Get a good look there of Stafford. And now Shira. As they go back toward a couple of
couple of disappointed astronauts. As they descend in the elevator, we expect to hear from Jack King at Mission Control, Cape Kennedy. This is Gemini Launch Control at the Cape. Astronauts Wally Shira and Tom Stafford are now out of the Gemini 6 spacecraft. They were helped out of the, over the hatch at 33 minutes past the hour. It is expected that shortly after they get, go down the elevator, they will get back to the crew quarters as soon as possible. Uh, we are still looking over our condition at Launch Complex 19. We expect that we will be able to start a news conference some 30 to 40 minutes from this time. This is Gemini Launch Control. And there at the foot of the pad, uh, the foot of the erector on the pad 19, stands the trailer, which will take astronauts Shira and Stafford <clears throat> back to their crew quarters over on Merritt Island, a few miles distant from the pad itself. It's a little ride that takes about five minutes over there. Merritt Island is the big complex immediately to the uh, west of the Cape, which is our moon center from which the Saturn rockets propelling the Apollo spacecraft toward the moon will take off. Scheduled now for well, the first test ones for a couple of years from now. got an early report on the weather forecast for next Thursday when the Gemini 6 is now scheduled to go. It looks good, they say, high and low scattered clouds. However, the Cape forecasters are watching two thermal systems, one expected to pass before the scheduled launch day and one shortly after. So presumably, uh, there's a little window of uh, good weather there on Thursday. It'll be one they'll be keeping their fingers crossed for. It's too bad that they could not have gone today. The weather was perfect at Pad 19 at Cape Kennedy and throughout the entire world in the prime recovery areas. There goes the van with uh, Shira and Stafford back to their Merritt Island quarters. So the President and Mrs. Johnson uh, watched this abortive launch effort and uh, the president's office at his LBJ ranch outside of Austin. And the president said in a statement released by his new secretary, we are all disappointed that Gemini 6 did not go off as expected. This launch had to be called off this morning because of a malfunction, which in the first indications seems to be a disconnected tail plug. There's Mike Wallace with his pencil showing us uh, the path of the van from pad 19 over to Merritt Island. I guess that's what you're showing us, Mike. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm following the pencil route. Why don't you tell us what, what this is? Walter, I think, I'm not, I'm not sure uh, that I, I saw them go out in uh, a couple of those amphibious vehicles. It looked to me as though nobody went aboard that air-conditioned van. It looked to me on the monitor, and I didn't see it probably as well as you did. We'll find out right now. Anyway, they were, they're on their way over to Mila, which means that they'll come down this road and then across the NASA, the NASA causeway over here onto Merritt Island and over to Cruz Quarters which, as you know, are over here on this 18,000-acre area of scrub, sand, rattlesnakes, and the John F. Kennedy Space Center. There aren't as many rattlesnakes down there as when that space program began. I think they, most of them decided to get out of the way after the first few uh, rockets blasted off. Mike, you might show us that Banana River again that the causeway goes over. That's where the helicopter crashed this morning and made a forced landing. Uh, one of the rescue helicopters uh, uh, had to land when an engine caught fire, but uh, the five men, including the paramedics aboard, got out all right. It's uh, right behind uh, Pad 37, I understand, that they crashed here in the Banana River. There are no bananas, incidentally, any place around as far as anybody's been able to discover. I'm told that it's called the Banana River, and it's about three miles wide at its widest because it's in the shape of a banana, not because of any vegetation down there. But the helicopter crashed just about in through here. Nobody 
nobody heard, as you said. Banana River empties into the Atlantic on down there at the end of what is this peninsula that uh, is called Cape Kennedy now. Except that that area is still called Cape Canaveral, isn't it? And the port is called Cape Cana uh, called Port Canaveral still. The port right there at the Cape uh, is still called Cape Canaveral indeed. You can see on the monitor behind me the progress of the van uh, as it uh, leaves the Cape, proceeds toward Merritt Island with Wally Shira and Tom Stafford for a second time being brought back from on top of that booster. I'm told now that signals have been changed and the astronauts are not going directly to Mila, Mike, but they're going to the Space Center Operations checkout building. Well, that's over at Mila, and that's the same one. I thought that they'd uh, made a change, but that's the same building we were talking about. We have further on the comments of uh, President Johnson uh, that he released through his White House News Secretary, Bill Moyers. He said they were disappointed, but our disappointment is exceeded by our pride in astronauts Walter Schirra and Thomas Stafford and the flight directors of NASA. With the world watching, they acted with remarkable courage in the face of danger and potential disaster. Their eager desire and determination to try again proved once more that men are the real heroes and the essential factor in space exploration. The statement by President Johnson uh, after uh, his disappointment that this flight of Gemini uh, 6 did not get off. Nelson Benton, down at our manned uh, space center at Houston, and give us some facts he's dug up down there on the problems of recycling or rescheduling this Gemini 6. Nelson? Uh, Walter, the problems aren't uh, totally straightened out on recycling, and uh, that, that launch that we're hoping for Thursday uh, isn't exactly pinned down. Right now at Houston, the, some of the thought is going back to the spacecraft that is in the air now, Gemini 7. Gemini 7 had been prepared for the rendezvous with six, and so now that that rendezvous is definitely not going to take place today, they're thinking of other things for seven to do. As you reported, the laser experiment, the attempt to communicate with an Earth station through a fine, narrow beam of coherent light is scheduled. That's a fuel expending experiment, and they will use a little fuel from the Gemini spacecraft on that. Otherwise, the astronauts so far have been instructed to look for targets of opportunity, uh, perhaps take some photographs. Frank Borman, the command pilot, reported he had a great amount of film that he has not used yet. And Elliot C. reported back to him that they are planning other assignments for the Gemini 7 crew so that they can make good use of their time since uh, things have gone a bit awry here. Uh, the spacecraft has been ordered to save what fuel it can uh, for the rendezvous and to use as little as possible on the experiments. Walter? Nelson, as I add up the figures here, uh, Gemini 6 ought to set that new space record at 1.26 uh, Eastern uh, Standard Time this afternoon. That's a little less than two hours from now. I just wonder if the boys in flight control there in Houston have any special celebration planned, a sort of a musical serenade, or are they going to shoot off firecrackers or anything? I think the mood's a little different from that right now, Walter. It's pure speculation. Uh, they're still working on a flight plan 4-7. Uh, it will, as you say, go past that record. We'll have a new record today in spite of the uh, gloom that has developed as a result of the problems at the Cape. All right, Nelson, we'll be uh, keeping in touch with you down there. Gemini 7 on its 119th revolution, now out over the mid-Atlantic, uh, just about getting in touch with the Ascension Station out there. They might find, uh, these boys, Borman and Lovell, up there in uh, Gemini 7, that they're going to be spending even longer in space than they had anticipated. There's just that possibility. Uh, during an interview with uh, Charles von Frem, Gemini flight director Chris Kraft raised the possibility of adding an extra day to the flight of Gemini 7, making it a 15-day flight in order to provide time for the rendezvous with Gemini 6. Yes, uh, and we are trying to provide for that uh, likelihood by putting enough uh, food and water on for the 15 days of flight. However, there are three, three other major consumables on board. We have uh, fuel cell 
cryogenic oxygen and hydrogen, which must, must supply the power, and uh, ECS, or environmental control system oxygen, cryogenic oxygen for supplying the breathing uh, oxygen for the astronauts. Now, those three things are really uh, somewhat difficult to compute exactly how long we can go until we've been up there for a number of days and seen how this is being used and whether they're, wh what the heat leaks in the, uh, in the bottles are. By, by that I mean what the uh, vacuum capability of the bottle is. It's a, it's a thermos bottle, so to speak. We don't know what uh, heat leaks we're going to get out of those bottles, really, uh, until we've had some experience with a particular bottle. Uh, we may uh, have the, the bottles may heat up so that you vent this stuff, and when you start venting it, you're just wasting it, and it goes overboard. So it isn't until we've been up there maybe nine or ten days that we'll be able to predict what our capability is in ter terms of t overall lifetime of Spacecraft 7. So we, we will be watching this trend as we prepare to launch Spacecraft 6, and we will know on the 13th day, of course, whether we have a 15-day capability in Spacecraft 7. That's Christopher Columbus Kraft, the uh, flight director at Houston uh, for these space flights. He's been in the man's program ever since Mercury was conceived. As a matter of fact, at the very formation of our National Aeronautics and Space Administration, Chris Kraft was on the original team, and he's one of the uh, key men, not the key man, in these flights. Uh, one of the other flight controllers uh, told us, as a matter of fact, that uh, Chris and Gemini 7, two days, if necessary, to get this rendezvous mission accomplished with Gemini 6. As it now stands, that will not be necessary. Uh, Gemini 6, uh, if all goes well on next Thursday, will get off at 8.43 in the morning and uh, make a rendezvous at uh, approximately 2.30 on Thursday afternoon with Gemini 7. Uh, then uh, it would return, Gemini 6 would, on Friday morning, and uh, Gemini 7 would return on Saturday morning of this week. CBS News coverage of Gemini 7, two weeks in space, will continue in a moment after station identification. Project Gemini, two weeks in space. From the CBS News Space Center in New York, here again is Walter Cronkite. And let us go directly to Houston, the manned space center, and the voice of Gemini Control, Paul Haney. Gemini Control, Houston here at 189 hours, 18 minutes into the flight of seven. Chris Kraft in the last few minutes suggested somewhat, more than somewhat facetiously, that perhaps Wally Shira and Tom Stafford didn't like the seven orbit for their rendezvous attempt and uh, indicating maybe the 161 circular would be more to their liking than the 161.5 in which seven is right now. This message was conveyed up to seven over Ascension and Frank Borman and Jim Lovell uh, joined right in the fun. The conversation went like this. Gemini 7 is now flying. Uh, two days ago, on Thursday, uh, they, let's see, was it Thursday? Yes, they circularized their orbit 
uh, to the exact point which they expected to be met by Gemini 6. In circularizing the orbit, using stars as their guidance signals on navigation, uh, the, uh, the two astronauts, Borman and Lovell, put their orbit almost exactly on target. The target was 161 uh, nautical miles uh, high, or 185 statute miles. They're a little bit higher than that by about a half a mile, just enough uh, so the decay rate in another four days will bring them almost exactly on that 161 mile height. And that was a jocular reference to the fact they aren't on the exact uh, height now, and that might have been why Wally Shira and Tom Stafford didn't go at this particular time. A pretty uh, good joke among experts. Here is film of Gemini control at the moment when the shutdown came this morning, at that critical, crucial moment. We have no sound on this. We're not permitted sound in there, but you can see the calm with which Chris Kraft and his team of flight directors uh, watched the developing operations. That was uh, Chuck Berry, the doctor, in the glasses you saw a moment ago. There's obviously no excitement, no panic there. They've seen these happen before. They're concerned. But they're a smoothly functioning team of experts. They've never seen this happen in manned space flight before. They have practiced what might happen in manned flight. For a few seconds there, it was purely a choice of Wally Shiraz as to whether he and his co-pilot ejected from that spacecraft or sat it out. They chose to sit it out the right decision. As you can see in those pictures, there was no panic, no excitement at Gemini uh, Control in Houston, despite what might have been uh, fluttering uh, in the hearts of those men who were in charge of this flight. And Gemini uh, six pilots are now back at Mila and are getting out of their suits while Gemini 7 continues in its 120th orbit, uh, passing over South Africa now, just about to go over Africa again. It is preparing for a important experiment when it comes back over the United States on this next pass. And over the White Sands, New Mexico proving grounds, uh, they will attempt to establish contact through a high-powered light beam called a laser uh, turned into a communications route with a uh, laser beam on the ground at White Sands. They've been told, however, not to use too much fuel to try the experiment. They have contacted one laser beam in six days, one out of a Hawaii station. The rest of the time, the laser stations on the ground in Hawaii, White Sands, and Ascension Island have been covered by clouds. And the Ascension station was out for some days. I don't know whether it's back or not yet. Uh, the Ascension laser beam, because of a missing part that they didn't have to replace uh, immediately. Uh, Hawaii, they, they saw the laser beam for the first time last night, but uh, were not able to communicate with it. This Gemini 6 was scrubbed uh, just uh, exactly uh, two hours ago to this very minute when uh, the, uh, after second and a half of ignition, the engines shut down. George Herman, who is now out at McDonnell Aircraft in St. Louis, has spent quite a bit of time at the Martin plant in Baltimore where these Titan IIs are built. And he can tell us something about that automatic cutoff device and just what happened this morning. George? Well, I think the first thing that we should note probably is that this is a triumph for the safety equipment on the uh, Martin Titan. After all, the Titan was designed originally as an intercontinental ballistic missile. And then the Martin company put a great deal of time and energy with the experts from NASA into what they called man rating it which is to say making it safe to carry something far more delicate than a nuclear warhead to carry a human being. And you may recall that the first word we got from NASA was that what might have gone wrong, although I believe that's now fairly well discredited, is that it went over to one of the other two redundant systems, either the redundant uh, control system, the redundant hydraulics, or to the redundant uh, electronic system, so that both of these were means to shut it down. It's really rather remarkable when you think about it, and no mean engineering feat, that you could shut down those seven million horsepower in a fraction of a second, stop it dead in its tracks, stop everything altogether. 
And now, uh, having done that rather remarkable feat, I imagine the silent men, the engineers that you never hear about, the people who are only heard about when something does go wrong, the safety engineers who designed the equipment to stop it, I imagine they're both melancholy that the flight uh, failed, but extremely gratified that their safety equipment worked so very well. There is a lot of work to be done, of course, still, besides the regular turnaround. Nobody's mentioned it, but if my recollection serves me rightly, there are in the valves uh, before the engines, there are certain bursting diaphragms which are broken when the pressure reaches a certain uh, value, and those will now have to be replaced. That means that part of the engine will have to be open and these new frangible diaphragms put in so as uh, fuel can be kept from getting to where it uh, might make contact and burst into flame before pressure has reached the proper values. So there is a certain amount of turnaround work to be done. Uh, one other element, uh, I don't know whether you've mentioned it or not, but the other element is, of course, that when the fuel is pumped out, which takes a number of hours, after the safety margins have been properly established, it won't probably begin for a while yet, after it's pumped out, it'll have to be chilled. Not that the fuel and the oxidizer and the Titan, are, they're, not, they're storable, so they don't have to be kept cold like locks. It's a fairly simple proposition. They have to be cooled so they'll shrink down, so they can pack more fuel into the cylinders. But all in all, what happened today is a, is a triumph for the men who, fortunately, up to now, have been totally invisible. The safety engineers who designed the extra margins of safety to protect and save the human beings on board. It was really, uh, although I don't suppose anybody will think about it in the disappointment, it was really a remarkable achievement. Indeed it was, George. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of reason for gratification uh, throughout the space program in this uh, failure today. As they told us so many times down at the Cape throughout the space program in the early days when we were having quite a lot of failures with our unmanned uh, space uh, uh, missiles in the early days of testing, they said that every failure proved something, that they were learning with every failure. And it was a little bit hard to tell the American people and even to accept ourselves as we stood down there and watched missile after missile blow up or tumble or fall or not make a, its a, a, fulfill its accomplished mission, that the, we were learning something. But it's quite clear we do. And today, what they proved out, first of all, as you suggest, was the safety system built into the booster itself. And then the men, every one of them, proved himself out uh, there in the cockpit of the spacecraft itself and in mission control. A smoothly functioning team that uh, when the emergency came, uh, they had found that their training fit the situation and uh, we have two healthy astronauts and a healthy spacecraft and booster ready to go on another day. Bill Stout with Bob Sharp at the McDonald plant in St. Louis. Bob, can you give us any idea of what they saw as they sat there in those seconds while the engines began and then were shut down? Uh, yes, on this forward part of the panel, we have a malfunction detection system. Uh, the needles here, the two on the left side, uh, indicate pressures in the uh, stage one uh, fuel and oxidizer tank of the booster. Uh, over here on the right-hand side, we have the stage two uh, tanks, which give similar pressure indications. We never got to those, though. Uh, we never got to those. Uh, so what happens is that uh, we have also two engine one lights. These are for the two uh, Aerojet uh, engines on the uh, first stage of the booster. These engine the lights are uh, illuminated red uh, prior to start. And then as soon as the engine comes up to uh, normal power range, the uh, lights will go out indicating a normal engine. Then uh, they should stay out then all through the uh, liftoff and the first stage of burning where they come on again at staging, which is a normal uh, engine shutdown. The uh, thing that Shira noticed evidently is that uh, within this uh, three to four second time period before liftoff occurred, evidently the plug must have fall fallen out and started his event timer, which would uh, make it run up here prematurely. And he noticed that, cut it, uh, caught it in time, and uh, uh, shut down the engine. Also, another indication that comes to them is the word liftoff, which is uh, given to them over the uh, communication system from the uh, uh, blockhouse control. So, uh, he used this system to uh, analyze the situation and uh, uh, act perfectly. Uh, some of the other things that he 
would have seen had liftoff occurred would be, say, on the attitude ball, the uh, needles, uh, which are now intersected in the middle, and uh, right here, which intersect in the middle, and are uh, uh, indicative of the rates that the, uh, or the rate of movement that the uh, uh, booster is experiencing uh, would also be steady here before liftoff. And after liftoff, you notice minute deviations of these needles. So uh, he took all of these into account, made the correct decision on this shutdown very, very quickly indeed. Could it be, Bob, that uh, as sometimes happens with uh, airliners, the warning symptoms came through, but there was really nothing wrong? Um, it's a possibility, although it sounds like if this uh, uh, plug or connector fell out, well, that is something wrong. And uh, like uh, Walter said a while ago, we do learn a lot uh, by our experiences. You can bet your bottom dollar that uh, that would be the last connector that will fall out. <laughs> it's the <laughs> first one ever, isn't it? I believe so. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And uh, if it hadn't fallen out, then uh, maybe there's something that was uh, not right in the program that uh, we would have never discovered. In this case, uh, when you catch a malfunction, you always uh, know what uh, has failed in, and you can do something about it and make the program better and safer in the future. And that, Walter, is pretty much what they're doing down at the Cape, trying to find out exactly what did happen and correcting it in a hurry for a Thursday launch, we hope. Bill and Bob, uh, Bob, I, I sort of gathered from what you were saying there that uh, you're, you're suggesting that Shira initiated the engine shutdown after he read the indication uh, there from his instrument panel. Uh, is that what you meant to say? Uh, did no. I misread you? Uh, no. If uh, he had uh, interpreted his instruments wrong, he would have ejected uh, in that case. The uh, thing that he did was right was interpreting him right and uh, not ejecting. Right, right. I understood that, but we have been saying it was an automatic shutdown. I just wanted to be sure that uh, we were on the same beam here. The decision, right. was, the decision that he made was to stay in the spacecraft rather than blow out the hatches. Now, that's right. The uh, thing is that with the automatic shutdown, the uh, engine lights come on red again there, which if uh, interpreted wrong there, uh, would show a, a uh, thrust failure. If this had happened right after liftoff, which normally uh, with the event timer running to indicate liftoff and these lights coming on red, well, it would be a certain ejection. This is, uh, this is the situation that he analyzed correctly. Right. Thank you. Uh, uh, just to recount, Gemini 6, uh, after ignition of its engines uh, were shut down, had the mission scrubbed this morning at 9.54 and has been rescheduled for Thursday morning at 8.43. Bill Stout, you recorded a piece for us a little earlier I'd like to show now. It concerns one of the big concerns about the flight of Gemini 7. Now, the astronauts Frank and uh, Borman and Jim Lovell have some concern that the job of flying their spacecraft for so long might tire them and thus endanger the rendezvous with the Gemini 6 space team. Several weeks ago, uh, you, Bill Stout, uh, talked about this with the astronauts' chief physician, Dr. Charles Berry. Do you see now, Dr. Berry, any levels of possible danger which might be reached at the 8th, 9th, or 10th day of the mission before rendezvous of the two spacecraft that might prompt you to call off the entire thing? Well, I think that uh, fatigue is one of the things that, that you mentioned that uh, we would We'll certainly be watching for signs of this and discussing it with the crew, too. Uh, we're going to be watching their uh, physiologic responses as far as heart rates are concerned. And uh, I think the only thing that would really uh, cause us any uh, considerable worry here is if we were to see that uh, the heart was not responding as well to any demands made upon it as far as uh, work is concerned or if we were to see that uh, we were getting some uh, um, slow enough rates that we were beginning to get arrhythmias develop, where we were getting a, a different heart rate uh, from than that initiated by its normal pacemaker, then I think we would certainly uh, give a lot of thought about whether we were going to continue the mission. And 
I think those are the main things. It's a very difficult thing to say. We try and, and look ahead to plan all the things that could possibly happen. And uh, uh, then, then we try and still have to play it on a uh, real-time basis. And all these decisions are really things that you have to make real-time. And some of them you just can't write ground rules about. No one's ever done it before. That's right. It's an area no, where no one has been before. One of the problems uh, with uh, men in, cooped up in a spacecraft, a little area hardly the size of the front seat of a compact car, is how they get along together. And that's one of the things that, indeed, this two-week flight is meant to test, besides uh, the physical deterioration which may occur in a weightless state for that long, such as demineralization of the bones, the calcium loss from the bones, and the lazy heart that develops because the heart doesn't have to pump against gravity for that long a period. These are things that are being tested by this long, the longest flight yet by man, and uh, the longest that we have planned until we, indeed, uh, go to the moon or beyond. Even the moon flight won't be as long as this two-week one, probably. But uh, one of the problems is the psychological effect on the men. And yesterday, in a uh, briefing of newsmen down at Houston, uh, Chuck Berry said that although things were getting pretty rancid in that tiny spacecraft with those unwashed, unshaven men, uh, they had not yet uh, uh, begun to hate each other or anything like that. Apparently, they're getting along just fine. As a matter of fact, their sense of humor remains uh, intact. They've been uh, kidding with the ground station on almost every pass. Meanwhile, the ground station has been trying to keep them amused by piping music up to them. Classical numbers are their greatest choice, but they did get one requested by Lovell's 12-year-old daughter, Barbara, uh, yesterday or the day before. I saw Mama kissing Santa Claus. And Lovell uh, passed back the word that he'd seen Santa Claus before he took off for this mission, presumably an indication that he'd gotten his Christmas shopping done early. And today, uh, one of the sidebars uh, of this flight, uh, if uh, presumably once things have quieted down a bit after this disappointment over the failure to launch Gemini 6, uh, Borman and Lovell will hear a 15-minute uh, special communion service recorded for them by the Cathedral of St. James in Chicago with a special hymn written for them. They're both Episcopalians, and this will give them an opportunity for 15 minutes of church services 185 miles above the earth as they hurtle along at 17,500 miles an hour. Presumably another uh, first for our space program. They have not uh, talked to their wives uh, directly. It was decided, uh, oh, a couple of flights ago that uh, this uh, chit-chat with the wives from Mission Control would be cut out, and uh, they have not done so. But what uh, the Space Center has done instead is wire the homes of Borman and Lovell uh, with a speaker system uh, right off of uh, manned Space Center control, Gemini control there, so they can, at any time, monitor these communications between the ground stations and their husbands. In other words, just tune them in and be sure they're getting along all right. That uh, tune, uh, I saw Mama Kissing Santa Claus, just might have been prompted by uh, maybe some hidden concern of Mrs. Lovell's uh, over the fact that when she and uh, Mrs. Borman sent a message up about uh, Christmas coming up and be sure to get back for Christmas, uh, Lovell came back and said, Bah humbug. Very shortly thereafter, Barbara was requesting, I saw Mama kissing Santa Claus to be piped up to remind him that he better get back in time for Christmas. And they certainly will be. Their debriefing should be completed, and they should be home in Houston in plenty of time uh, for the big day. Meanwhile, they are circling the Earth in their 120th turn of Mrs. Lovell's uh, over the fact that when she and uh, Mrs. Borman sent a message up about uh, Christmas coming up and be sure to get back for Christmas, uh, Lovell came back and said, Bah humbug. Very shortly thereafter, Barbara was requesting, I saw Mama kissing Santa Claus to be piped up to remind him that he better get back in time for Christmas. And they certainly will be. Their debriefing should be completed, and they should be home in Houston in plenty of time uh, for the big day. Meanwhile, they are circling the Earth in their 120th revolution. Uh, they're just out over the Indian Ocean, passing uh, between the Tanana Reeve Station and the uh, Carnarvon Australian Station. Uh, they have been up now eight days, 
And in an hour and, uh, let's see, an hour and 16 minutes, they will set a new record in space. We're holding on here to, uh, in hopes that we can get uh, at least part of that news conference that will be held in Houston. Uh, to tell us about the events of this day and let the uh, space experts answer questions from the newsmen of the dramatic developments on pad 19 when the flight had to be called this off even after ignition. Control. Here's Houston Paul Haney in Houston. 189 hours, 39 minutes into the flight of seven. For your reference, the flight of Gemini 5, the record that will shortly be surpassed, was 190 hours, 56 minutes. And Chris Kraft says we plan to give uh, seven a special salute when they pass that point. Also, for your information, the project officials here in Houston and down at the Cape are still huddling. And uh, we expect that news conference at the Cape to start perhaps 15 to 20 minutes from now. Meanwhile, some information on city passes. The seven spacecraft should be viewable from these cities in at these local times, all times local. We have a date on the, for Los Angeles on December 13, 6.52 a.m. Pacific Standard. On the 15th of December, 5.29 a.m. On the 16th, 5.34. On the 17th, 5.40 a.m. And on the 18th, 5.46 a.m. El Paso should be able to see the spacecraft on the 13th at 6.19 a.m., on the 14th at 6.35, again on the 15th, 6.31 a.m., local El Paso time, on the 16th, 6.37, on the 17th, two chances, 5.08 a.m., and 6.43 a.m., and on the 18th, two chances, 5.13 a.m. and 6.49 a.m. Houston should be able to see it on the 13th at 7.15 a.m. On the 14th at 5.52 a.m. On the 15th, 5.58. On the 16th, 6.04. On the 17th, 6.10 a.m. And on the 18th, 6.15 a.m. The Cape area should be able to see the spacecraft at, uh, on the 13th of December at 6.48 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, on the 14th at 5.30 a.m., also on the 14th, 6.54 a.m., on the 15th, two chances, 5.26 a.m. and 7 a.m., on the 16th, 5.32 and 7.07. On the 17th, 5.37 a.m. And on the 18th, 5.43 a.m. That was Paul Haney, a voice of Gemini Control in Houston, uh, telling that the, the times when uh, various cities and areas in the United States might be able to see Gemini 7. It appears as a tiny spot in the sky, as a, a large star, as a matter of fact, uh, moving quite rapidly, of course, and very low in the heavens. The declension from the uh, Earth's surface is uh, at a very sharp angle, uh, or a very small angle. The sky is still fairly dark as a backdrop, but the sun is up enough to uh, reflect on the spacecraft and what one sees in the ground is a reflection of the sun against the shiny surface of the spacecraft at a low declension. <clears throat> we are going to wait for that news conference coming up uh, now perhaps in 15 minutes just as soon as those men at the Cape uh, finish the, their business and assessment of what happened this morning uh, and uh, can tell us in more detail about it. What we can do, however, is now see uh, what happened this morning and listen to the voice, voices of uh, Shira and Stafford, or mostly Shira, talking to uh, Gemini Control as these events took place. It begins at T minus 10 seconds. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Reset. This is all secure. 
seven I six uh, monitor take pressures. The exercise of pressure is down to about thirty two. Roger. Roger Wally, I'm watching it. Okay, keep it on. say it again, another amazing demonstration of how the long years of practice and training, uh, more than five years for Shira, uh, caused him to perform so coolly under fire uh, this morning. Speaking of long training, uh, by coincidence, just today, the uh, Soviets, through uh, the TASS news agency, revealed how training also prepares a man for flight in a weightless state uh, of space. In the flight last October, of uh, the three men who flew in shirt sleeve environment for uh, one day for 16 orbits, the pilot who had had uh, years of training, Komarov, uh, suffered no ill effects. But the two uh, non-cosmonauts, the scientist and the doctor, who had had just three months training, Vyaktasov and Yegorov, uh, both of them uh, were sick, uh, disoriented, uh, suffered space like motion sickness uh, during the most of the flight of that uh, plane. The Soviets draw the conclusion that training is absolutely essential. And so we saw, as we took another look at that uh, abortive, uh, uh, the abort on the pad of Gemini 6 this morning and heard the astronauts, uh, we're reminded again that all was lost today for want of a tail plug. Maybe you remember the poem about a war being lost, all for want of a horseshoe nail. Because of that, the shoe was lost, the rider was lost, the message was lost, the battle was lost, and the war was lost. But today, because of a faulty tail plug, 
the $50 million uh, launch of Wally Shira and Tom Stafford had to be scrubbed. Just how easily little things can turn into big things is part of every military man's training, including Shira's and Stafford's. Maybe they remember seeing a training film practically every new recruit is shown in our military forces, one in which a battle in the South Pacific is lost and an entire company is wiped out because of the condition of one recruit's boots. Well, the same as rocket failures, a number of airplane crashes seem to have turned on the most trivial of causes, it seems. There was that uh, series of crashes at Elizabeth, New Jersey a few years ago, one of which happened because of a single nut that someone had turned a quarter of an inch, a quarter of a turn too tight. And then there was that crash in Jamaica Bay of a plane that had just taken off from Kennedy Airport. And the reason for that one, it was believed, was a cotter pin had fallen out of a vital part. And even wars have been lost by things as little as horseshoe nails and cotter pins. There's a theory that the Spanish Armada failed and England survived simply because of barrel staves, new green barrel staves in the water kegs of the Spanish Armada. They shrank, the water was lost, the Spanish sailors could not fight, and the English won in the battle. In fact, some historians credit America's uh, winning the uh, Revolutionary War to one fellow in London who insisted on closing his dispatch office on time at 6 p.m., undoubtedly for a spot of tea. Because of that, these historians say, a crucial message to General Burgoyne missed the boat. Today, the same old story of take care of little things and the big things will take care of themselves have been told again at Cape Kennedy. The tail plug failed, the mission was scrubbed. That's the belief at the moment. CBS News coverage of Gemini 7 and 6, two weeks in space, will continue in a moment after station identification. This is CBS. Project Gemini, two weeks in space. From the CBS News Space Center in New York, here again is Walter Cronkite. And Chuck, uh, down at the Cape on a monitor I have here, I can see the back of your head in the front row uh, waiting for the news conference to start. In fact, there is the uh, picture now. We've got it on the air. You're right in the center of the picture. You're the big fellow in the uh, white shirt uh, holding, a, uh, uh, holding up an earpiece. <laughs> and Chuck, yeah. what's the mood down there? Here I am. And uh, Walter, you caught me again without my coat on. Uh, I'm afraid Bill Paley or Dr. Stanton are going to be furious again, but it's all introduced by Jack King, who is the spokesman for uh, the Cape Kennedy NASA operation. Chuck Matthews still smiling. Chuck, why that smile? <laughs> Walter will be standing by now. Here comes Jack King up. One, two, three. There we go. I'd like to introduce these gentlemen to you, please. From your right, Dr. George Miller, Associate Administrator, NASA, Office of Manned Space Flight. Major General Ben Funk, Commander of the Air Force Space Systems Division. Mr. G. Merritt Preston, Deputy Director for Launch Operations of the Kennedy Space Center and Deputy Launch Mission Director for the Gemini Flight. Mr. Charles Matthews from NASA's Manned Spacecraft Center, who is Gemini Program Manager. Major General Vincent Houston, Commander of the Air Force Eastern Test Range and also representing General Davis, Commander of the DOD Support for Gemini. And Colonel Otto Ledford. Colonel Ledford is Commander of the Air Force Space System Division's 6555th Aerospace Test Wing at Cape Kennedy. Dr. Miller. Uh, good morning. Uh, we are, uh, I'm sorry that we took so long in getting over here. We wanted to be sure that the uh, astronauts had been safely removed from the uh, uh, launch vehicle, space vehicle, and also that the uh, condition of the uh, launch vehicle itself was safe. Uh, as you know, uh, we, we did have difficulty in the, uh, uh, in the uh, ignition sequence of, of, the, uh, uh, of the launch vehicle. And we're and we are uh, uh, proceeding now to determine both the cause of the uh, shutdown and the uh, uh, time for uh, uh, turning around. 
Uh, we expect that uh, it will take something on the order of four days. We do have a, uh, a procedure uh, which has been developed. Uh, the normal length of time for this procedure is four days. We are, however, working hard to find ways of moving the, uh, uh, the next launch attempt back. I'd like to say just a word of commentation to the crew, uh, both on the ground and in the, and in the spacecraft itself, for uh, their prompt and, uh, and very uh, uh, mature handling of what is always a very difficult situation. I'd like you to turn you now over to General Funk. Naturally, we're very disappointed that we didn't go today because our people, our teams of contractors, Air Force and NASA, did work very diligently in achieving this eight-day turnaround for the GT-6A vehicle. The launch of GT-6A was scrubbed due to the engine receiving a command to shut down by the malfunction detection system. A pull-away disconnect malfunction giving a premature liftoff signal prior to programmer start. This not being a normal sequence, the malfunction detection system operated normally and shut down the engines. Engine start and engine shutdown were normal, fortunately. The cause is now under investigation. A recovery plan will be reviewed in detail later this afternoon. In effect, you might say that we had a flight readiness firing. There's no history of this type of shutdown before. Uh, we might say that the count was extremely uh, well done. There were no problems that came up on either the spacecraft or the launch vehicle. Uh, this is what attributed to the precise timing. I might point out that this uh, malfunction that did occur should no, be no way associated with the rapid turnaround. Uh, it's, uh, there's really no connection, so I don't think you should draw that conclusion. Uh, we are going back at it, and uh, we will attempt to launch as soon as possible. Dr. Miller gave you the general uh, time that we now forecast, but like the recycle plan, we'll do it as fast as possible. Mr. Matthews? Actually, uh, <clears throat> the uh, plan for the 76 mission uh, did involve consideration of these types of factors. And as you are aware, we do have subsequent launch opportunities um, that in which uh, we have one pane uh, opportunities and two pane op opportunities subsequent to this time. Uh, the uh, ability to uh, make this attempt early has uh, provided us with some margin to continue and we're also of course very happy to state that the uh, spacecraft 7 is in a uh, stable situation and uh, good indications it, it can uh, continue on for its planned mission and with the additional time we uh, certainly expect that uh, we'll be able to uh, both correct the problem and uh, get into a recycle configuration to uh, uh, make another attempt at our 76 operation. Thank you, Mr. Matthews. General Houston? <clears throat> there were no problems with the range or the DOD forces. Went straight through the count without any hitches or delays. Um, after shutdown, we did retain the uh, launch site abort forces until the uh, astronauts were back on the ground. Thank you, sir. Colonel? Uh, we had a very uh, smooth countdown, I think, that everyone knows here. Uh, high degree of professionalism and uh, uh, shown today. Uh, I think we've seen it throughout the countdown we've had from the launch of uh, GT-7, actually. The abort uh, shutdown did not uh, cause any damages to the stand. The launch vehicle is in very good condition. We uh, are examining the work that has to be performed between now and the next launch in an attempt to do it as quickly as possible. 
We do have a plan. We have a plan that was developed some time ago, revised in October, and we are be examining that uh, today in an attempt to compress as much as we can to make the launch as quickly as we can. Very happy with the performance today as far as the countdown, and very happy with the performance up to, the, to today in getting ready for the countdown. Thank you, Colonel. We'll now take your questions, Mr. Muller. Uh, will you try a wet mock, or will you skip that and go straight to a launch situation if you can? We will, we will recycle right into another launch. Picking up uh, at most of the mid count, which is the day before launch. That's right. Chuck. Yes, uh, I guess, Press, this is for you. What Most of the mid count, which is the day before launch. That's right. Chuck. Yes, uh, I guess, Press, this is for you. What would have happened to the Germany 6 flight if the uh, malfunction uh, system had not shut off the engines? In other words, were they close to disaster? Well, uh, first of all, the uh, the flight hardware there was nothing wrong with it. In the when it when the plug dropped, this was a sensor which gave a false indication which caused the shutdown. So if it had a, actually lifted off, I'm confident we'd had a successful flight. Well, if I could just pursue that again, uh, are you indicating that this might have been just a, a a faulty thing here, or uh, well, the point is that the the shutdown was caused by this plug dropping out prematurely, which has nothing to do with the bird. In other words, the flight hardware. So actually, they were not in any danger then, uh, not from a, a poor flight. No. George, what was the uh, nature of the plug press? So what, what oh, kind of plug was it? The, the plug carried the signal, which indicates uh, whether the programmer is, is working properly. In other words, in these last three minutes, we, we check all of the critical circuits to make sure they're working, and they're tied into this circuit, which if they're not, they'll shut the engine down. This is part of the malfunction detection system. And it was only the detecting system that failed, not the actual programmer. This gentleman here. If this is the only failure, couldn't we launch on Tuesday? The problem is that the engines have had a start. We have to go back in and check the engines, and most all the work that we will be doing will be in checking the engines of the launch vehicle. You have to conduct Thursday is the soonest. No, I wouldn't say Thursday is the soonest. The Thursday would be according to the pre-planned uh, plan that we have. We're going to go as fast as we can, and we're making a study of this this afternoon and tomorrow to come up with the earliest possible date. Bill? Or General Funk, you had a planned ignition time of 9.54.06. What was your actual ignition time? Do you know? I believe the ignition was 03, Bill. The liftoff was 06. It, it was right on the, right on, right on the money. Yes. Right on the second. Right. 03. Thank you. Ed? Uh, this plug that came out, how big a round is it, or what's it uh, look like, and where is it located on the vehicle? It's an electrical Ed? connector. Electrical plug. It's small. Perhaps maybe I can answer that. Go ahead. That's better. Uh, the plug is right at the base of the missile. It's a. It's covered with a cowling, uh, so to speak, uh, which protects it from the airstream. It's about uh, two inches in diameter. It's a normal. It looks like it's like a cannon plug. It is a plug in the true sense. It's not an umbilical. And you pull this out at liftoff. Doug. Automatically when the vehicle lift off, there's about a half inch slack normally in the uh, lanyard which uh, pulls the plug away at, at a normal lift off. And what happened here, the plug dropped out uh, prior to uh, lift off, which gave us a uh, malfunction detection. There's no, uh, the uh, plug comes out as the booster rises, is that it? it just that is, is correct. Right next to him. <coughs> Uh, I presume in the uh, astronaut's cabin, the uh, liftoff, uh, premature liftoff light lit, and not knowing they were going someplace, uh, is this a credit to uh, the judgment of the astronauts that they didn't uh, pull the D-ring, or were they aware of what was going on uh, immediately also? Well, they, they practiced this uh, very uh, uh, problem many, many times, and 
they have to have two signals before they will abort. They did receive the liftoff light in the cabin. They did not see, receive any of the other signals, and probably the most significant one was the actual feeling of liftoff themselves. And yes, you would have to say it, they were exerting very good judgment, but they'd had good training for this actual situation. Uh, the second question I had, in preparation for a launch, even if it were for tomorrow, or the next day, or any day, what is the procedures that must be gone through insofar as uh, preparation of the engines and the tanks and the new fueling system, if you could well, please in detail? It, uh, it's primarily, as uh, Mr. Preston indicated, uh, work in the propulsion area, Doug. Uh, we have to reinstall the uh, pre -vials. we have to purge the system. Uh, these normal uh, propulsion type items that have to be accomplished after each firing. 90% 90, 90 of the work is in the propulsion area. And it's all, uh, all indicated here, and all we're going to try to do is shorten it. I'll see you later. How can such a plug fall out? How is it held in? It's uh, held in by an indentation system. Uh, it's hard to conceive how it fell, uh, would fall out without being pulled, but it's, it's possible. Clark. It takes about a 40 to 60 uh, inch pound pull to pull the plug normally, and it was checked. Uh, well, uh, it's hard to tell. Uh, it's, that's, a, that's a mystery right now. Because it wasn't put in all the way in the first place. Uh, I'd like to clear up one thing uh, Mr. Preston said about where you would pick up the count. Did you say you would, the, the best you could possibly do would be to pick it up at mid-count one day before launch? Uh, the spacecraft probably would run, run a mid-count since it's not the critical path. The uh, launch vehicle primarily, after their engine checks, picks it up with the count. That's right. Uh, so, um, so this is part of what we're going over, but I would suspect that there will be adequate time for that pre-count, I mean the mid-count. Probably no uh, sim flight necessary then. No sim flight no. will be repeated. No. Uh, I have two disconnected questions. I guess uh, one of them is for uh, uh, Chuck Matthews. These, uh, the spacecraft was on internal power. Uh, I suppose that that means the batteries had been activated and so forth. Will those batteries now have to be replaced or do you just shut them down? No, they will not have to be uh, replaced. The time on the batteries is relatively uh, short. So we, we do not anticipate really any spacecraft uh, change-outs or any changes in configuration. There might be one experiment, the uh, radiation experiment, that we might want to take out of the spacecraft. Uh, they, those batteries are on internal power prior to the count, so this is not unusual. I see. The other one is for George Miller. If it turns out that you are not able to get Gemini 6 off during the time that Gemini 7 is up there, what are your plans for Gemini 6? Will you use one of those new Mach Agenas that you announced yesterday? Uh, um, no, we haven't, uh, we haven't yet uh, uh, analyzed the situation, but this is one of the reasons for uh, going forward with the uh, backup to the Agena vehicle in the event that something of this sort c should occur. And just to follow that up briefly, if you were to use one of those mock Agenas, then what in your judgment would be the earliest time you could fly six if it did not get off during the seven orbits? Now, the earliest time would be late in the first quarter. Doc, did you want to read that now? This might be a good time. Uh, I, uh, I have here a statement from the new Deputy Administrator of NASA, Dr. Robert C. Siemens, uh, that I'd like to read. Uh, quote, we proceeded in a planned and orderly way in preparation for the Gemini 6 launch, and great credit is due the Gemini team for developing procedures prior to launch to minimize failure and its effect, and then for carrying out these special procedures in such a precise manner. Particular commendation should go to astronauts Shira and Stafford for correctly interpreting data available and acting appropriately during the critical engine ignition period and subsequent shutdown. Back up here. Uh, yes, we'll make it available for you. So Just one, uh, one brief question about the plug. It's only friction that holds it in. There is no latch of any kind on it. Uh, yes, there is an indentation uh, here. You, you 
It's like a cannon plug. You slip it in and turn it, and you can hear an audible click when, it, when the indentations come into place. I see. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask was that there was a mention of a small uh, propellant leak somewhere in the craft. Uh, not clear whether it was booster no. spacecraft or what. Can this you is the TSV drain I believe you're referring to. Uh, that uh, You mean after we had shut down? Is that what you have reference to? Yes. This is normal. Uh, this is the uh, drain valve pressure. Drain valve. This gentleman right here. How long is the plug? How many are there in the at the base of the missile? Uh, can you tell us that? Well, there there are two type of plugs like this in the uh, uh, missile. There, this is the only one that carries this particular signal. The other carries other signals. Uh, they're roughly three or four feet, three or four inches. Uh, What's it made of? It's a metallic uh, type uh, plug. Right there. Um, what happened after the plug fell out? Could you give us a sequence there? Is that when the sensor detected something was wrong and the malfunction detection system took over? Uh, that's right. Uh, the plug is in there to uh, act as an inhibitor to the intervalometer and the programmer. That uh, So when you remove the plug, you have removed that inhibitor or short or open, and uh, the intervalometer starts working. So uh, this is not... Uh, supposed to occur until liftoff. <coughs> Mr. Simon? I have three unrelated questions. One is, we were told yesterday the weather is deteriorating tomorrow. What, what's the newest, latest weather report for the week that you have? Two is, will uh, 7 decay in orbit by Thursday, and will that affect the rendezvous attempt? And the third is, could you give us some idea of what kind of danger was involved until all the engines were shut down? I think Chuck Von Friend was trying to ask this question. Were the astronauts in any danger after uh, ignition and then shut down, sitting on top of the fuel missile? The first uh, question about the weather, um, we only have a real rough cut on this, but it looks like Wednesday will be pretty good weather, but that's fairly far away, so it only has a certain amount of reliability. Um, what was the second question? Oh, the orbital decay. There's no indication that the lifetime of seven uh, is in danger of supporting the launch and, and the rendezvous if we go on the third or fourth day. And the last question about the hazard. Uh, yes, there is a hazard. Um, uh, probably the greatest hazard is the transient that the engine and launch vehicle sees when this engine starts and then suddenly shuts down but it's been done uh, quite a number of times, and uh, it's, it's some element of risk, and that's for sure. What can happen? I guess you could go all the way to an explosion if you want to carry it to the limit, but this is extremely remote. Uh, you're, you're shocking these valves. When you shut this engine down, you're, you're, you have this propellant floating, uh, flowing, and you're sort of water hamming the valves, they could break. Well, you recognize, uh, you recognize that uh, uh, we have started and stopped these, uh, these stages many times before. Right. So that at this particular point in the sequence, uh, there, there uh, was no excessive danger. I think that uh, uh, that uh, uh, you, you do have a certain amount of risk every time you climb on top of, uh, of, a, of a pressurized vessel of this sort, uh, but I don't think that it was uh, an abnormal risk in that sense. As I indicated earlier, the, the engine start and shutdown were normal. We didn't have any indication of a rough combustion type start, which might have, of course, uh, caused a leakage of valves or lines and thus uh, uh, caused some peril in terms of the danger of explosion or fire. That's why uh, I feel the engines are in good condition and why our uh, recycle plan uh, four days is reasonable. This afternoon later we will review that plan to see if we might possibly be able to beat it. Yeah, I might mention in that connection, of course, a large number of Titan IIs, which is, uh, of course, a very close relation. Uh, 
uh, to the Gemini launch vehicle uh, undertook static fires as a regular procedure earlier in their program. And of course, on our first launch vehicle, we actually made a static firing uh, prior to the launch of that vehicle. Um, we uh, did not continue that activity primarily because it was a we felt it was only required to demonstrate the uh, the uh, operation on this new vehicle only one time. Or it isn't a really abnormal situation to uh, to to start a stage and then shut it down again on ground. Mr. Mark, the uh, there was a minimum crew went out to the uh, pad after the abort. Um, how, how would a minimum crew compare in numbers with a normal crew? I don't know how many people were out there. I don't think there were more than five, ten out there immediately afterwards. Immediately after, uh, about five or ten, uh, they were suited up and uh, out there. We keep, try to keep it down to the minimum. Uh, that's the right number. Uh, I'm, I'm still confused, Press. Does the plug and the cable, does this carry electrical power for the malfunctioning detection system, or is it an actual Car circuit between the booster and the blockhouse, or what? It carries the signal back to the blockhouse in the malfunction detection system. Of course, this signal then tells whether the system is working right or not. Or not. Now, if it's disconnected, it can't carry that signal back. Uh, right behind there. Uh, how was this uh, shutdown similar or dissimilar to GT2 shutdown? Same uh, sequence of events, but uh, different reason. Same type of shutdown. You have a normal shutdown of events, uh, shutdown mm -hmm. sequence. Yeah. I think there is a, di a yeah. likely difference in that, uh, in the case of uh, GT2, of course, the malfunction system worked as designed and uh, uh, prevented the liftoff under a condition where there was a an actual component failure and of course this took us uh, the order of magnitude of six weeks to recycle from that particular failure in this case uh, the operation appears to be uh, an inadvertent operation of the um, no failure of the malfunction detection system but an in inadvertent operation that uh, did not uh, relate to a failure of the airborne system. <clears throat> You're confusing. Can you tell us, uh, uh, Mr. Merritt, what is the earliest time you actually can fly six? I realize that you've had some seven, seven days of very quick time activities, and based on that experience, don't know. can you tell us uh, what is the possibility uh, of earlier than, say, even Wednesday? Earlier than what? Wednesday. No, Wednesday's only three days, and Thursday would be four days. And w earlier uh, than Wednesday is two. Um, no. if we, uh, any attempt to do it before Wednesday is, is getting rather no. difficult. That's all I can say at this time. I, uh, you, is you it really po possible or just difficult? Well, at the moment, if I had to say one way or another, it would be pretty close to impossible, but we're certainly going to try everything we can. It, yeah, I have it here. Thursday is 8.43 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for 47 minutes was the information and we had earlier. Wednesday, it's 8.37 for the first window and 10.13 for the second. I also have some information that was passed on that the GT-7 spacecraft is decaying one-fifth of a mile per day in its orbit. Good. I'd like to go back on the plug again for just one minute. Is it a command link or a, a telemetry link? Neither. It's a copper hard wire. In other words, it's a, it's a copper line running from the blockhouse through this plug up into the bird. Right, but some lines you could lose, uh, some channels of information uh, temporarily and still go on with the count or the launch. Uh, is, is this more to be considered more of a command link of... Uh, well, this is tied in to the, well, the malfunction detection system, which samples certain things in the launch vehicle to assure us that they're working properly. And this particular function, which was the programmer, it was sampling the function of this programmer. And because the line broke, 
it indicated that the programmer quit, which it didn't actually. Uh, didn't actually, it? Tim, well, maybe you could answer that a little more directly by saying it's an interlock. Yeah, it's an interlock, that's interlock. right. Well, I guess my question really is, where did the kill signal come from? From ground equipment? The kill the signal, when you interrupt the circuit, then the blockhouse equipment shut down the engine. Send a signal to shut down well, the engine. Well, you the intervalometer it was running, and uh, that shut it down. Uh, the the intervalometer, as I understand it, was running <coughs> at a time that it should not shouldn't be. be, and it couldn't be reset. And uh, this is a something that is sampled in an automatic sequence. It's no manual, no no uh, human consideration to this. There's certain things we sample before that bird lifts off, and if they're not right, it is automatically shut down. Press, I know that these probability estimates don't always mean a whole lot, but now you've said that any attempt before Wednesday is pretty close to impossible. Would it be your judgment that a Wednesday launching is a 50-50 possibility, less or more than that? And see what we can to do it. But, uh, Are you now reasonably confident about a Thursday launch? Well, the Thursday launch is the planned turnaround time. We have to look at the data right now. We have a review of the data this afternoon to find out if there's anything else. We'll, we'll take two more questions from here. Go to Houston, then we'll come back to try to handle any other questions. Go ahead, Chuck. Yes, uh, this is for press again, I guess. Uh, you've been working 24 hours around the clock out of Pad 19 during the past eight days, and you've had an understandable uh, disappointing letdown today. I'm wondering about uh, how the launch crews themselves are going to be from the standpoint of mental or physical fatigue and getting ready for a Wednesday or Thursday try again? Well, they have been working on shift bases. They have been working more than an eight-hour shift. Uh, but I think there is sufficient uh, motivation here to stimulate them again. Undoubtedly, there is a letdown, but also there is the motivation to get back at it and get this thing done. Uh, I think that whatever letdown there was, which there bound to have been some, is probably over now, and they're right back at it driving hard to go ahead again. Will you put them on a 24-hour uh, shift the way they were last week? They'll go back That's on the right. same uh, 20. Well, it's not well. really a 24-hour sh shift per person. It's 24-hour coverage of work. Right. Yes, they will. We'll work 212s. But uh, as Mr. President says, there's a lot of desire here, and that's the reason we're here today. And we still got that desire. We're going to make it. We can. Two related questions. Can any of you give us an idea of the astronauts' plans as of this point on? And does the, do the support forces have to change anything to meet this delay? As far as the astronauts, uh, I haven't heard any plans on what they uh, plan to do, but I expect they will stay right here and continue training in the simulator. Uh, General Houston, I think you might ask. As far as the support point. forces are concerned, uh, there's no reason to change that we know of. However, uh, the recovery uh, plan may cause some changes later. But this, again, is a function of when we will launch and when we will recover. So as of this instant, there's no reason to think we'll have to change. But there may be. I saw two more steady hands over here. We'll take those two and then go to Houston. Mr. All right, fine. Could you give us some idea of the men, themse the men themselves? Uh, who has talked to them since they got out? What, what, is, their, what is their attitude there? Uh, well, I think uh, it can be said that uh, uh, they've, uh, they've experienced this operation before, and uh, they're the type of people that bounce back very readily. I feel that uh, uh, they are are prepared for such eventualities. They have knowledge that these things can exist, so it's uh, not uh, a complete surprise to them. And uh, the people that are talking to them, uh, Al Shepard and the uh, uh, rest of the flight crew people are, uh, went over to the blockhouse and they're now, they did uh, go over to pad 16 uh, to um, change back into their regular civilian type uh, suits and I imagine they'll be taking it easy the rest of the day. Well we have and so we learn that the irony of this abort of Gemini 6 today was that the malfunction detection system itself failed but in failing proved that it works for the safety of the astronauts. In other words using the analogy that we were talking about a little earlier the horseshoe nail wasn't lost, but there was a report that the horseshoe nail was lost. 
And so Gemini 6 uh, was not launched at 9.54 this morning as planned. The astronauts, Shira and Stafford, are out of their flight suits now and uh, safely back uh, at uh, their quarters at Mila, the, uh, the Merritt Island launch complex across the Banana River from Cape Kennedy. They are said to be in good spirits as good test pilots. Uh, they proved that what good test pilots they were today by performing perfectly in a critical couple of seconds that could have spelled the difference between life and death for them. They stayed aboard their spacecraft while the engine, after only one and six tenths seconds of firing, shut down with the booster and the spacecraft still on the pad. It shut down when a plug came loose uh, at the base of the spacecraft that gave an indication of some malfunction so that the engines shut down. And now the launch of Gemini 6 to go on its 103,000 mile chase of Gemini 7 uh, is scheduled for Thursday morning at 8.43 p.m. Uh, it could go as early as Wednesday, however, at 8.37 in the morning, but they would not give at Houston, as you heard, or at the Cape, any odds on going on Wednesday. They're going to try. Meanwhile, Gemini 7 is in one, its 120th orbit, just coming up over the United States again, and it will be making in just a moment or two its attempt to establish communications by means of that laser light beam from 185 miles over the White Sands, New Mexico. We're going to have another color Gemini report after the National Football League football this afternoon. And we'll be back, of course, for the Gemini 6 launch, Wednesday or Thursday, whenever that attempt is made. This is Walter Cronkite at the CBS News Space Center in New York. This has been Project Gemini, two weeks in space. This is CBS.